I'm here to tell the truth as I see it. That's why you've been following me all of these years. That's why hundreds of thousands of people are watching, listening to this broadcast tonight and over the next six nights until the next one, because you recognize that I will tell you what I really think. I'm not telling you what somebody paid me to think. I'm not telling you what a focus group advised me that other people want to hear me say. I'm telling you because I believe it. On the subject of Jeremy Corbyn, I was his close friend and comrade for almost 40 years. And over the last four years, when 99.9% of the British media was slavering with their hatred of him, seeking to tear him to pieces and bring him down, I was the only person, literally the only person, with a national media platform, platforms, that was defending him. That's because the attacks on him were wrong, were unjust, were untrue. And that's because I was defending that which I saw to be right. As to the Labour Party, frankly, I owe them absolutely nothing at all. Well, I, know I owe the old Labour Party uh, everything, from my council house to my uh, bathroom in the house to my front and back garden, to my cod liver oil and orange juice, to my free education. Not that I took advantage of it at university level, but it was there if I had wanted to, and free at that, even with a grant to pay for it. But since Tony Blair took over the Labour Party in 1993, I owe the Labour Party nothing at all. As a matter of fact, they owe me. At the very least, they owe me an apology. Neither am I seeking to return to the Labour Party. I'd rather poke my eyes out with a sharp and boiling pin than rejoin what is today's Labour Party. After all, I'd probably either be assaulted or I'd assault someone else. I'd probably be under arrest if I was in the corridors of the House of Commons with Dame Hodge and Wes Streeting and Coyle and Kyle and all the other fifth columnists that have done so much to destroy Jeremy Corbyn's chances last time and next time. So there's your health warning. You've tuned in here because you want to hear what I think, and you're free to think what you like about what I think. You're even free, indeed you're welcome, to call or to text through Twitter or even to Skype your take on events. So here's mine. The national opinion poll today that shows the Conservatives 14 points ahead of Labour is likely accurate. It's true that of the last seven polls, the margin between the Conservatives and Labour is narrower than that, though all of them have the Conservatives in the lead. But the poll yesterday was a 10% Conservative lead, and the poll today is a 14% Conservative lead. And that just goes to show that Britain is not Twitter. Britain is not London. And if you think the next general election, whenever it comes, and I'll come back to that, will be fought and won on Twitter or in London, you're very sadly mistaken. As I pointed out on Friday, in the black country, anybody that thinks that this forthcoming general election will be about anything but Brexit certainly wasn't in the black country on Friday, where 68 and 70 percent leave majorities were recorded in the referendum. And they haven't gone away, you know. They haven't changed their minds, you know. If anything, they are even more angry 
about the EU and about the Romanar parliament that has conspired these long four years to destroy the decision made by the British people. I'll say again what I've said before. It is inconceivably impossible to believe for me that Labour people cannot see that the best possible optimal conditions for a general election for them is after Boris Johnson has taken Britain out of the European Union and Brexit is behind us instead of always, always in front of us. That to me is so obvious a blind man could see it. After all, if there are going to be bumps in the road with a no-deal Brexit, who will get the blame for them? Boris Johnson will get the blame for them. If you're going to hold on to five million Labour Leave voters in hundreds of Midlands, Northern, South Wallian constituencies, then you've got a better chance of doing it once we've already Brexited. That seems to me so obvious, so plain as the nose on your face, so ABC. But I have shouted myself hoarse trying to persuade some of you of that, and I have failed. My predictions have been bang on all along, and you know that to be true. You know that I was virtually the only man that predicted Brexit would win the referendum. In this very studio, as the polls closed, and the bookies told us there was an 89% chance of Remain winning, I still said right here in this studio that Brexit would prevail. I'm the only man you know that predicted Donald Trump would be elected President of the United States and for a full year before he actually was. I predicted that the Conservative Party would break apart over Brexit. Was I right or was I right? I also predicted that Brexit would break the Blairite ramp away from the Labour Party. I predicted the Labour Party would split, that the Blairites would leave over Brexit. I was wrong about that but only because the Blairites are back in charge. There's no reason for them to break away. They're calling all of the shots. And not just on Brexit. Ask Chris Williamson if you don't believe me. Ask Jackie Walker. Ask Mark Wadsworth. Ask Ken Livingston. Ask those that fought against the adoption of the IHRA definition on anti-Semitism. Ask Mark Regev, the highly successful Israeli ambassador to London, if the Blairites are back in charge. I know you don't like to hear this, and I don't like to say it, but it's true. Labour's Brexit policy was made and is being implemented by Tom Watson, Keir Starmer, I'm sorry to say John MacDonald and Diane Abbott and Uncle Tom Cobley and all amongst the Blairite ramp. They're calling the shots. That's why Labour is first of all refusing the people a general election You'll remember last week, on Monday, it was stop the coup, general election now. By Wednesday, it was stop the election, coup now. I tell you, outside of Twitter, outside those who shriek their loyalty to today's Labour Party line on Brexit, everyone else out there in the country knows that it's 
cowardice. It's fear of what's going to happen in the general election if it were held immediately, which is what, until last Monday, Labour was demanding. And what's Labour's policy going into the general election? I'll tell you what it is, and I'll tell you what it looks like. What it is and what it will be, please note, I know more about the Labour Party's line than those stalwartly defending it. It's going to be a free vote for all Labour MPs, shadow ministers or ministers, as it would be in those circumstances. It's going to be a Labour deal renegotiated with Brussels, just like Mr Wilson's in 1974 and 75, and a free vote for all Labour members, whatever their rank, in a referendum in which the choice will be between Labour's deal and remaining in the European Union. But here's what it looks like. It's Labour's deal and remain with all of Labour's top leaders fighting for remain against their own deal. Now you tell me if that does not look like the craziest political position ever adopted by any political party. Now Labour will say, the legend that is Damien from Brighton will say, well, Labour's not going to campaign its own deal against its own deal. But if your foreign secretary, your deputy prime minister, your chancellor of the exchequer, your home secretary, your Brexit secretary are all campaigning against your own deal for Remain. In what sense is Labour not campaigning against its own deal? There's only one way that that could be undone. And that would be if Jeremy Corbyn were to support Labour's own deal. But I'm here to tell you that he will not do so. He will play the role of Mr. Wilson in 1975 and remain imperiously above the fray, studiously neutral about Labour's own deal. So you're going to have a Labour deal which the Labour leader will not campaign for and which all the other leaders will be campaigning against. Tell me if that is not political insanity. Now, I don't even support Labour's deal. Labour's deal is not Brexit for me. Staying close to the customs union, staying close to the single market, is not Brexit for me. After all, me and Jeremy Corbyn stayed up all night, many a night, trying to wreck the single market, trying to break the customs union, because we knew that Maastricht and Lisbon were giant elephant traps for the British working people. I haven't changed my mind. I was against those things then, and I'm still against them now. Mr. Corbyn evidently has changed his mind. Fair enough, everyone's entitled to change their mind but I have not changed mine. But if you're going to go into election promising people you'll renegotiate the deal and then campaign against your own deal, you'll look utterly ridiculous, farcical. I have never seen or heard of anything so ridiculous in my long political life. So, why don't we have a general election now? What is Boris Johnson going to do? Well, tomorrow there will be a motion in Parliament under the Fixed Term Parliament Act, which will require a two-thirds majority of MPs to vote for an election 
on the 15th of October. It will fail because the SNP and Labour will not support it. What happens next? What happens next is that Boris Johnson will introduce a one-line bill calling a general election, guaranteeing that the government will not change its date. And that just might go through and might give us a general election before the witching hour of Halloween, 31st October 2019. But if it doesn't, what will Boris Johnson do? Well, he's already told you. He'd rather die in a ditch than go to Brussels and ask for yet another extension. He will test, to use his words, the legality of the Ben Bill, the Ben Ban the Brexit Bill that went through the House of Commons last week. What does he mean by that? He means that he'll go to Brussels, but he will not ask for an extension, which will then give Ben and other parliamentarians just days to convince the Supreme Court that the government has acted illegally. And if the court finds that it has acted illegally, condign punishment may follow for the Prime Minister Boris Johnson. He may be jailed for trying to implement the Brexit decision. Many on Twitter and in London may rejoice, rejoice at that. But how do you think it's going to play out in the sticks? How do you think that's going to play amongst the electors in the North, in the Midlands, in South Wales, in the Southwest, in Essex, in all those hundreds of seats, the great majority of seats that voted Brexit in 2016. You better be careful what you wish for. There are other options. It may very well be that actually the country has already legally left the EU. Because if Johnson's action of prime ministerial fiat would be illegal in October of 2019, then equally Theresa May's prime ministerial fiat in delaying the Brexit earlier this year would be equally illegal. And if it was illegal, then we've already left. It may be that Hungary or Italy may vote against giving us an extension anyway. It may be that Britain will be in a position to veto the giving of us an extension. One thing's for sure, when you clear all of the barriers to the principal optics, they are this. The Conservatives are trying to implement the Brexit decision of the British people, and Labour, the Liberals, the Nationalists, the Greens are trying, endlessly trying, to obstruct and block and ultimately wreck it. Therefore, that's what the general election will be about. And if you're confident that Jeremy Corbyn can win an election fought on that basis, I'm here to tell you I am not. Not because I don't want it. I don't want Boris Johnson in power for one minute longer. I would give my right arm to see Jeremy Corbyn in number 10 Downing Street. I'd give my left arm too. But I'm here to tell you that this course on which Labour has set itself will not lead to that outcome. And I do so on the basis of having been right throughout this period and on the basis of 50 years 
of political experience in the Labour movement, most of it in the Labour Party. My last line. If Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage agree a pact, an electoral pact, or even a non-aggression pact, it'll be a landslide defeat for Labour. If Johnson and Farage do not agree an electoral pact or a non-aggression pact, then there may still be something to play for. That's my take on the British Brexit imbroglio. But that's not all we're going to be talking about tonight. Because this is the 18th anniversary, imagine, of 9-11-2001. We'll be talking to one of the great experts in the world about what happened, how it happened, why it happened, and what we don't know about what happened on 9-11-2001. Stay tuned. It's going to be rock and roll radio with pictures. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. On Sputnik with Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert. Tune in. Well, maybe mention... <laughs> Maybe mention like central bankers and, and you know markets are doubling down. Not you were saying everybody's doubling down. They're crazy. <laughs> they are. Everyone's crazy. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, a progressive Democrat for America, PD, America Dot Org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning, I'm looking for what's on the queue for today. I tune to Fault Line with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Fall Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Ali and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Tune in every Monday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for our regular segment, Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers, where we take a look at the state of education across the country, what's happening in our schools, colleges, and universities, and what impact does it have on the world around us. Our resident expert is Bill Ayers, the legendary activist, educator, and author. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Monday and every Monday for Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. You're watching the mother of all talk shows, or you're listening to the mother of all talk shows. Either way and wherever you are, a very good evening, good afternoon to you all. Hellos from Motherwell, Oregon, Detroit, Austria, Vancouver. Too many, I'm afraid, to mention. Tina Buckley says... Hey, George Galloway, can I have a birthday shout-out? I've also brought some new listeners, she says, from Yemen and Canada tonight. 
eagerly awaiting the mother of all talk shows. Many happy returns, Tina. God bless you. Jimmy Jenkinson. Corbyn has more faces than the town hall clock. AJ, George talks to you as if you were a naughty child. Well, some of you are. Shalim Mia says, Jeremy Corbyn has great ideas, but he has no leadership qualities. He likes to be led rather than to lead. Dakota says, I got into university to try and further my education. I'm glad I'm able to see George Galloway and George Galloway motes time to further my knowledge. And DJ Augustus says the EU doesn't want to give us a deal because if they give us a good deal, it will encourage other members to pull out. The only deal available is the one given to Mrs May, which is one leg in the EU and one leg out of the EU to serve the EU's interest. And Kira McColgan says, brilliant opening, putting across what the Labour Party pre-Blair was. Well, that's right, Kira. And I've got to tell you, it was easier to be in the Labour Party under Harold Wilson and James Callaghan, and even under Tony Blair, than it is to be under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. Just think about that. I'm the only person that Tony Blair expelled. And only then because I was, well, how shall I put it, somewhat rebarbatively opposing his ongoing war against Iraq. Think how many people have been expelled from the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn. And just as unjustly in many cases as my own expulsion under Tony Blair. Just think about that. Under Tony Blair, you could say what you liked about Israel and Palestine. You can't do that under Jeremy Corbyn. Under Tony Blair, you could say Israel was an apartheid state. You can't say that under Jeremy Corbyn. You could say that Israel is a racist endeavor under Tony Blair. I did. So did Jeremy Corbyn many hundreds, thousands of times. But you can't say that under Jeremy Corbyn, I'm sorry you don't like to hear this, but these are facts. Anyway, I'm joined now by one of the brightest journalists, reporters, commentators, and one of the best radio presenters in the land. And I should know, because I am the best. He's the second best. He's Patrick Christie. Hello, George. Who joins me now. Patrick, a joy. Uh, to, to see you. We're not going to go out of business anytime oh, no. soon. This story is going to run and run. I've been interviewing about this, or you interviewing me, yes. uh, for, the, for the last four years. Let's recap on where we are now. It seems clear that Parliament will not vote to have a general election. So Parliament is blocking Brexit and blocking a general election mm. at the same time. That's a coup, isn't it? All in the name of democracy, of course, <laughs> which is democracy, this bizarre yes. kind of Orwellian state that we live in at the moment where mm. you even have a party with Democrats in the name that are campaigning to overthrow a massive democratic referendum. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's bonkers. Look, uh, the fact is that, that Boris Johnson obviously wants an election because he is pursuing essentially now a no-deal Brexit. That has been essentially blocked, really, in the House of Commons, so he wouldn't legally be able to get it through. There is an interesting situation where he might end up going to prison if he doesn't uh, adhere to that, so we'll have to wait and see how that one uh, pans out, you can argue. I don't think he'd like the food in prison. No, no, I don't think or he'd... Or the showers. I don't think he'd look good in bright orange, you know, but uh, <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. You could argue that maybe a few previous Prime Ministers should be in there with him, but exactly, uh, yeah. it's a story for another time. Look, we, we are in a bit of a mess at, at, at the moment. Just to recap, generally, I suppose, obviously yeah. Boris Johnson wanted to prorogue Parliament, which is essentially suspend Parliament, for a period of time to, to stop all this faff and this delay that, and the opposition, frankly, that there would be to either his version of Theresa May's deal or no deal. But let uh, me stop you there. If, if he knew, hmm. as I presume he should have, that all this was going to happen, why prorogue Parliament? I mean, hmm. it didn't gain him anything. It was a bizarre call, and people are actually criticising Boris Johnson for how much of his ear he is giving to, essentially, one of his chief of staff, Dominic Cummings, who uh, fronted up the Vote Leave campaign, 
and is regarded as a bit of a bulldog. In fact, he even uh, sacks a lady on the spot and got her marched out of uh, Downing Street at, with an armed police guard, actually, after she was alleged to, anyway, have, have leaked some government information. So he doesn't mess about. Um, and people are critical of the fact that this guy clearly has so much influence over Boris. It was a bad look for him, actually, I thought, because it played into the hands of people that say, essentially, the Tories are anti-democracy and they're elitist and, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're Mr. Establishment. Um, I, look, I don't think it was that. It was essentially legal and constitutional. Well, uh, it's one thing or the other, you see. If he, if he could have prorogued Parliament mm. for just five extra days, mm. which is hardly uh, closing Parliament down, and succeeded thereby, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Well, he... But he did it and then failed because 21 of his own members... Uh, cross the floor effectively. You, see, you could argue that Parliament has prorogued itself for the last three and a bit years, actually, because yeah. the fact is that they are elected to make decisions and keep the wheels of this country turning. Mm. And they've just jammed a massive spoke in there completely. They've just gone, right, well, we had a democratic vote, we're going to do everything we can to possibly thwart this. You've got the Liberal Democrats campaigning to, to completely remove Brexit. Labour apparently now want to negotiate a better deal and then hold a referendum and campaign for Remain. I mean, that is, that's nuts, really. Well, not the party itself. Uh, yes. But it might as well be because yeah. all their leaders will yeah. be campaigning against yeah. their own deal. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this is sophistry. Uh, some say, well, the party will be neutral. But you're not neutral if you're Chancellor of the Exchequer, your Foreign Secretary, your Home Secretary, your Brexit Secretary. Uh, uh, all the top leaders yeah. are, and Tom Watson, the Deputy Prime Minister, if he gets back into the next parliament. Um, and that's a moot point. Uh, all these people will be campaigning against their own deal. How's that going to look? Well, I think it's going to look awful. I think it's going to look especially bad for Jeremy Corbyn. His main thing is that he's a man of deep conviction and principle, and he's prepared to go against the grain and stand up for what he believes in, and that's what he claims to have done. Well, he, 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 he did has do it. for yeah, decades. For, yeah. And that stopped now, hasn't it? Because, it, look, it, in my opinion, Jeremy Corbyn's a Brexiteer, right? I, I refuse, personally, I refuse to believe that he went into that polling booth uh, when we had the referendum and voted Remain. It would go against, seemingly, everything that he said in the, in the previous years, right? So, what's happened? And then you end up with him now, where he's essentially is, for all intents and purposes, campaigning for Remain, in a way. We look at it and go, well, is he a man of deep conviction and principle, then? Because at the whiff of power, has he decided to kind of flip-flop on that issue? I find that a, a difficult thing for Jeremy to, to, to come to terms with. I also think think that as and when we do get a general election, this will be a major sticking point for him. Sure. Because he was always not particularly popular in parts of the north of England, mainly because they don't view him as the traditional Labour leader, as it were. Um, and those people couldn't bring themselves to vote Tory. Can you imagine going down the working man's club after you've just voted Tory in you know, parts of the north west? I mean, you get hounded out of that. So they couldn't do that, but they don't feel like they can vote for Jeremy Corbyn. But I'll tell you who they will vote for, Nigel Farage. And that, for me, it means that basically the Brexit party now has a lot of sway. Uh, it comes down to whether uh, Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson make mm. some kind of pact, doesn't it? I've just predicted uh, before you came in, if they do, then Labour will be defeated in a landslide. Yeah, because 65% uh, or so of Labour-held constituencies voted leave. 25 of the 35 main target seats voted leave, many of them overwhelmingly. Mm. Uh, and they will lose a lot of their own marginals and fail to gain marginals that are their targets if there is a, a deal between Farage and Johnson. Yeah, what do you think? Farage has, has come out actually and said that, that as long as Boris Johnson openly pursues the no deal line on Brexit, he will put together a non aggression pact, which is basically that. He yeah, will... but it's all him. Uh, Johnson's not, uh, mm, yes. not dancing yet. I, well, look, I think he'd be mad not to, as an election, personally. Um, I, I think that what would end up happening, it would be like shooting yourself in the head, really, if he didn't. I think they'd, we've seen what's happened in the two by-elections that, that, that we've had so far in Brecon and Peterborough, I believe. Not, look, the, the Brexit party split the Tory vote, you know. So, well, you don't want that magnified over the, the whole country. So, look, I, realistically, I would put good money on the fact that I think that they would do some kind of deal. And that, that again, realistically, that could lead to, depending on which poll you look at, an 84-seat, 100-seat majority, potentially, for, for those parties. It, look, it will mean the hardest of hard Brexits, and obviously it will give Nigel Farage, finally, his, his seat in Parliament, potentially. Um, so, yeah, a, a, lot, a lot to happen there, but, look, realistically... Not just in Parliament. Uh, he'd, he, he would drive a harder bargain than that. He'd be looking to be in the Cabinet. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, about that. Labour will have an outstanding manifesto. Mm. Uh, Labour will have brilliant policies, in my view, on 
everything else except Brexit. And they'll be hoping that after the first few days at least, when the media has to officially, has to legally, has to report fairly what Labour is saying about all these other mm. matters, they'll hope to not park Brexit because it's far too big a tank to park, but at least take the wind uh, out of that issue a little by moving the agenda on to other things. What's your view on whether they have a chance of doing that? I think it's, it's really, really unfortunate that at a time in this country when we have massive social issues, we have huge issues with our NHS, we have huge issues with our education system, we've got huge issues with transport, things that Labour really should be leading the way on, and things that I will be pretty confident Labour in their manifesto will put considerably better policies forward than the Tories on those issues, because that is what they're there to do, essentially. And I just fear that all of that is going to get ignored, because as and when we do have a general election, it is just going to be about Brexit. And I think that it, 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 they will fail to get picked up as much in the media, and I just think that's a shame nationally. I think that's well, because shame. the Tories will be talking about nothing else. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Here's a call. Let's uh, see what Michael in Clapton-on-Sea uh, wants to say. Uh, Michael, welcome to the show. Good evening, George. Good evening, sir. But I want to take you to task. Oh, go ahead. Uh, on uh, the... Oh, I've got a terrible echo on my phone. No, it's all good um, here. You're broadcasting to the world. Don't worry. OK. Um, uh, it, it's just that you, you've got this discourse of that if somebody it says, op op opposing to you, they are fools, liars and cheats. And this is you know, painfully obvious that every parliamentary person in opposition to what you think cannot be a liar, a cheat or a traitor. Actually, there's um, many hundreds of liars and cheats in the House of Commons, but you're paraphrasing uh, what I've said falsely. Uh, I don't recall saying any of those words in my 23-minute uh, monologue. So give me further and but better the particulars. The basic principle of what you're saying is Tell me then. Tell me. Uh, go it, and uh, give me some examples. In opposing to, you know, to uh, Brexit, is a liar and a cheat, and uh, would, uh, would uh, you know, is, is unfair and un unprincipled. Well, it's, well it's, let me deal with that point first, and then you can come back. I'm saying that if you have a referendum and you tell people that they will make the final decision, then you send up a pamphlet paid for by the taxpayer which repeats that promise that whatever you decide, we will implement. And then you trigger Article 50, which ineluctably leads out of the European Union. If you then spend the next three years trying to block, obfuscate, obstruct or wreck that which you promised, you are a liar and a cheat. You, you've worked on the print, you've worked it out that in your um, estimation that that, the, uh, that decision is it's not based a, on a true uh, uh, this, um, debate and, and also that with the knowledge that you've accrued in that time, it's a bad decision. But Michael, uh, uh, Michael, I'll let you back in. Don't worry, let's make this a conversation. Uh, Every general election that I have ever fought, which is everyone since 1964, has been filled with people giving what I regarded as untrue information, misleading claims, distorting the point of view of the opposition. Every election. Does that mean every government since 1964 has been illegitimate? No, of course it doesn't. Over to you. OK, that, that's a fair point. And that's one I, I've got difficulty in arguing against. And I have to try and be fair. That's a, a salient point. Right, George, George, let me just change tack slightly then. OK. And ask you, what, one thing that I have never heard in three and a half years is any Brexit, Brexiteer, give any economic estimation of the consequence of leaving with no deal. 
could you, has there been any study, for uh, economic study, mm. to say what a well, Brexit party or Brexiteer mm. would estimate yeah. that, you know, yeah. in other words, are you going to tell me yeah. how many people do you think will lose their job well, uh, through no, Brexit? Uh, uh, first of all, I'm not in the Brexit party, so I'm not speaking for them. Neither am I speaking as someone who wants no deal. I do want a deal. I do say that by taking no deal off the table, you're guaranteeing the worst possible deal. Because, you see, I've represented workers in factories. I've been a negotiator. And if I went in on behalf of my workforce and told the boss, whatever you offer me, we are not going to walk off this job. I am guaranteeing that the employer will take the hardest line possible. Therefore, keeping no deal on the table was not just the sensible, but the only tactic for anyone in a negotiation. I want a deal. It's the EU that will not make a deal. And for the reason referred to in a tweet just a minute or two ago, that if they give us a good, clean, friendly break, then one European Union country after another will be for the off. Can't you see that, Michael? Oh, George, I totally agree with that. That's so two things we're agreed on. This, so you, you, you're contradicting against yourself because Why? you're saying that you don't want no deal. I, I, but I have never that... said I want no deal, but I'm not actually afraid of no deal. If the EU will not make a deal with us, then we'll have to make the best of it. Michael, and, and, and so Mike, Mike, tell Michael, me what you Michael, think Michael, 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 yes. 79 years ago, this night, London was on fire. Sheffield was on fire. Liverpool was on fire. Clyde Bank was on fire. We were being blitzed this night, 79 years ago. Are you telling me that we should be held to blackmail because it might be more no, difficult to no, get some rock fort George, cheese? Tell, tell, tell more me difficult to get a cross channel ferry? Tell me how many people you think will lose their jobs I, I, in, a, in a Brexit, I, I, a no deal I, Brexit. I, I have no idea. All I know is well, this. What, how all, all how I you know, have the nerve to tell people the Brexit if, you have not, if you're not but, telling them the repercussions? That's 2016's argument, Michael. That argument was had in 2016. I'm no longer arguing with you about the merits of Brexit. I'm arguing with you about democracy, about the right of the majority to have their decision, their vote, implemented. I'm going to read you something before I say goodbye to you. We lost almost 50 years, almost 50 years without a say, without a vote, says a correspondent. My entire life has been spent in the year EEC, EU, against my will. Nobody ever said times have changed. Nobody ever said they didn't know what they were voting for. Nobody ever said this is a constitutional outrage. They pushed further, decade after decade, treaty after treaty, against my will, in my name, without my say, not one solitary vote. He goes on, I got my single vote after a lifetime. I saw the banks, the government, the foreign leaders, the universities, the unions, the businesses, the corporations, the talking heads, the papers, the news readers, the stars. I saw them all lined up against me. I had nothing but a single vote. They have power, almost unrestrained, definitely immoral, absolutely ruthless, power. They used my taxes to lie. They took my money and that of people like me. They told me I was stupid, ignorant, racist. They promised if we Brexit, there'll be hellfire and damnation.
But I trudged forward through the sneers and insults. I am a nobody, but I have a vote. I cast my vote, never expecting to win. But he did win, Michael, and he will not accept the Parliament stealing his vote from him. Michael, thanks for the call. Patrick, your comments. Uh, he's right, actually, in the sense that we weren't given all the full facts. We weren't told that we would definitely have an increase towards greater federalism if we stayed within the European Union, that we would find ourselves in some kind of European army that could presumably be sent off to fact, war they, without, the, without the consent fact, of they, any they of our They told people. us we were conspiracy theorists yeah. when we alleged... A dangerous fantasy. Yeah. That's reality. That's what that it's is. It's happened now. It's happening. They budgeted you can, for it you now. Can touch it. It's there. It's yeah. happening. You know, and this is this is the issue. I, I just think as well that there seems to be a crisis of national confidence in this country, and I can't work out why. Okay, it's all very well and good when you have the Bank of England and people like that coming out with these disaster forecasts, right? They know which side their bread is buttered, and there's a reason behind that kind of thing. But just have a look at Britain. Have a walk around. Meet people. I've got confidence in this country. I've got great confidence in this country, and that is based on historical, uh, tangible facts, right? And there's nothing that's going to change that. London is still going to be a major draw to absolutely everyone. Our economy is still going to do all right. In fact, you can argue it's going to be better because we can reshape it. And what is so wrong now with actually believing in Britain a little bit? And that's what's something that, that, well, that gets you to know, me. Well, Patrick, uh, in the last 45 years or more since we joined, our industry has been completely destroyed. Uh. All the things we did and made before we joined, we no longer do. Our economy is completely skewed in the interests of those buildings behind me. I want Brexit because I want to rebuild Britain's manufacturing and trading capacity. And now we'll have the whole world with whom to trade, mm. to make free trade agreements with every part of the world that the EU has no free trade agreement with. We have WTO terms trading with most of our customers in the world. Most of the countries in the world that trade with the EU do so under WTO rules. This is just the latest episode or chapter of Project Fear, isn't it? I would have thought so. I, I mean, again, it's, just, this is, it's not difficult to see why there is this crisis of confidence when our key institutions seem to be relentlessly talking us down. Look how volatile the world is at the moment, all right? You've obviously got Donald Trump and I suppose anything could happen there in a sense. China's making serious inroads absolutely everywhere. The Middle East is the Middle East. Africa is, is still up for, up for play, I suppose, as well. And you have a look around and go, do we really, in these quite volatile times, want to be shackled to something that makes decisions for us on our behalf in a different country by people that... How many people in this country, if you stop them on the street now, know, seriously, who the President of the European Union is? But I bet most people, pretty much everyone, knows who Boris Johnson is. That's better democracy, isn't it? You can see your leader, you know your leader, and that seems to be... Well, you can vote them out. Things. You can vote them out. Exactly, and this is the thing, they're accountable. Now, in these volatile times, and in a changing world, and a shifting world, where you could argue that maybe the world order is, is changing a little bit, we should reserve the right to be able to react to that however we want to. And we cannot do that if we are shackled to this club in Brussels that just seems to line their own pockets more than actually get anything done. Let's hear from Lewis in Bedfordshire. Lewis, go ahead, sir. Oh, good evening, George. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Oh, and, and uh, it's great to be on the show. I, I, I love this show. and uh, I'm actually a Conservative Party member, so I'm probably not your natural... Um, You're welcome, viewer, nonetheless. Yes, but no, I love your show and Thank you talk you. a lot of sense. But um, one point of view I just wanted to put across and I wanted to find out what you thought about um, is I, I believe that Boris Johnson should break the law. Um, I think that, as you correctly said earlier in the show, that the, 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 it's unprecedented at the moment what's happening to our country. Um, the state of parliament... Uh, we've had basically, in my view, three and a half years where we haven't been living in a democracy. We haven't, we haven't had the uh, vote honoured, and we've had MPs who have changed party three times um, in the same parliament and have not put themselves up for election once. Um, in the same year, it, in fact. There are people now on their fourth political incarnation 
in one year, still sitting in Parliament. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, I think that the situation, people are saying if the Prime Minister broke the law, it would set a dangerous precedent. Now, I think that's true. But the most dangerous precedent here is that basically a democratic decision has not been enacted by our representatives. As I said, I don't think we have been living in a democracy for the past three and a half years. We've had a radical speaker, and now we've had a new law that through coercion compels the prime minister of this country to go to Brussels, prostrate, with his tail in between his legs, begging for an extension. And they have humiliated and embarrassed our country. Thank you, Lewis. So uh, thank you. A very, very uh, good call. Let me ask Patrick to uh, deal with it. Uh, did you hear it, Patrick? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, will Boris Johnson break the law? Uh, will he face the consequences? Look, it's difficult to say at the moment. I think there is a chance that he might. I do think it does... It, it, look, it's not ideal for your Prime Minister to break the law, obviously. However, I thought the caller there made some good points. And also, there are MPs on the other side, David Lammy being one of them, that, that is calling for open civil disobedience at the moment because they feel as though their side of the debate isn't being heard. And I don't know how badly it would actually play with the vast majority of the public, this, because they are fuming with what's going on in Parliament at the moment. They feel as though there's been a dereliction of duty from our MPs, and there probably has been, to be perfectly honest with you, and so, actually, a, a politician who's coming in with a, a bit of gumption behind him, with, wants to get the ball rolling for it, and he's willing, presumably, in, in, in a way to almost martyr himself for it, you would think actually probably would play very well with his base. So, you know, we'll have to wait and see what he does, of course, but it wouldn't necessarily be the worst idea in the world. Salgata is in Dubai. Salgata, go ahead. Hi, George. It is wonderful to talk to you. I've been following your shows for a long time. Thank you, sir. And I have a very uh, profound, uh, a fundamental question to ask you. That wh What is the point in the democratic conference that Jeremy Corbyn started to surrender? What is the exact reason why Jeremy Corbyn surrendered? Well, I don't like to use the word surrender. Thanks for the call. Uh, um, the truth is, isn't it, Patrick, that uh, you and I both uh, have a view on how he voted, mm. actually, in the referendum. Uh, I personally believe that he remains a Brexiteer. I yeah. uh, don't believe that he experienced some Damascene conversion somewhere. So I couldn't, I'd be lying if I tried to point to it. Uh, but the fifth column around him is what changed his mind, isn't it? Mm. That uh, he would no longer be the leader of the Labour Party if he had stood up for what he believed in. And yet, he only became the leader of the Labour Party because of his reputation of standing up for what he believed in. Yeah, this is it. And look, I suppose the main function of an opposition leader is to try to get into number 10. Mm. That ultimately is probably the baseline of what you're supposed to yeah. do. And he's in this rather awkward situation where he clearly doesn't want a general election at the moment. That in itself isn't a good look. I can understand the political reasons behind it, of course, but it does give the appearance, perhaps, that maybe he's better at campaigning against things and shouting from the opposition benches than he would be in a leadership position. But yeah, it, it, the fact is that if you've got a Labour Party that is still so confused about what it actually wants Brexit. When he did his big speech in Salford the other day, he came out and went, someone in the crowd went, so will you at a general election be campaigning for Remain or Leave? And he just couldn't answer. We're three and a half years along the line here now from, from when that vote took place. That's a bad luck. And he was the first man uh, to call for Article 50 mm. to be triggered. The yes. very first day after the referendum result. Also, consider this as well. So Keir Starmer voted in favour of Article 50, right? Which obviously, as we know, is a time-limited period at the end of which, if you haven't got a deal, you leave with no deal. He's then voted against every deal presented to him since. And then here we end up now with this, where we go, well, we're going to get no deal. We think, well, what did you vote for it for then? It, it seems absolutely bonkers. And in that situation, isn't he more to blame if we get a no deal than the likes of Boris? Well, a good point. Patrick Christie's uh, thanks very much for joining me. The best of luck with your uh, radio show, which is going great guns. I'm a listener uh, myself. It's the mother of all talk shows. Of course, there's two hours still to go. Stay tuned. It's rock and roll radio with pictures. Breaking news, expert analysis and exclusive stories all in one place. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold.
Hi, this is Max Kaiser. I'm here with Stacey Herbert, and we're doubling down. Yeah, we're doubling down on crazy. We're doubling down on our new show called Double Down on Sputnik. It's doubling down on absolute joyous radio nirvana. You will love it. You will want to listen to every single episode on Sputnik. Bye, y'all. <laughs> Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Sputnik News. Taliban leaders in Afghanistan have vowed to make the United States suffer after Donald Trump canceled peace talks, which were due to take place today. The U.S. president tweeted yesterday that he had been set to meet Afghan President Ashraf Ghani and Taliban negotiators, but he canceled the secret meeting due to take place at his Camp David retreat after the Taliban admitted that they were behind a recent attack in Kabul, which killed a U.S. soldier. In a statement in response, Taliban spokesperson Zabihala Majid said the talks had been going well until Saturday. Pulling out of the peace process before the signing of the agreement because of one explosion shows the U.S.'s lack of maturity and experience, he added. He also maintained that the Taliban and the Afghan government had agreed to talks on September 23rd, although the Afghan government has not confirmed this. A face-to-face -face meeting with the Taliban at Camp David, the site of past historic peace negotiations, would have been an extraordinary diplomatic move by the U.S. president, especially as it would have come just ahead of the 18th anniversary of 9-11. President Trump is also being investigated by a U.S. congressional committee over a potential conflict of interest over military spending at a Scottish airport near his luxury golf resort. The House Oversight Committee alleges that military expenditure at Presswick Airport in Scotland has increased considerably since the president came into office. The debt-ridden airport was bought by the Scottish government for one pound and it's close to Trump's Turnberry Golf Resort. The airport is said to be integral to the Trump business, which is also loss-making. The committee's accusations are detailed in a letter to the Pentagon, which is dated in June, but was only revealed on Friday. The letter requests access to all communications between the U.S. Department of Defense Defense and Trump Turnberry, as well as any related financial records. According to various reports in the U.S. media, the department has not yet complied with the demands. It is also not commented directly, and neither has the Trump Organization. Next, Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson has suffered another resignation from his government over Brexit. Work and Pensions Minister Amber Rudd has quit Johnson's cabinet with an outspoken attack on the government's approach over leaving the European Union. She claimed that there were no formal negotiations between Britain and the EU over a leaving with a deal. She claimed that there was very little evidence the government would get a new Brexit deal and she had only received a one-page summary of efforts to get an agreement when she asked for details earlier last week. She said proper discussions about policy had not been taking place, suggesting senior ministers had limited involvement in the PM's decisions. However, Chancellor of the Exchequer responded that ministers were straining to get a deal with the EU. He said the government has many new ideas for proposals to break the deadlock over the contentious backstop plan and the deal previously agreed between Theresa May's government and the EU aimed at preserving the seamless border on the island of Ireland. The deal has been rejected three times by the UK House of Commons. He also claimed it would be madness to talk through the details of the government's proposals openly. And finally, a senior U.S. senator is claiming that the U.S. Navy is withholding information about the sighting of UFOs. Mark Walker of North Carolina, a member of the Intelligence and Counterterrorism Subcommittee, said that he was frustrated that his inquiries were not being properly answered by the Navy over what he described as the threat superior aircraft flying in U.S. airspace may pose. He claimed that sightings and footage taken by U.S. pilots and other personnel on warships revealed unknown aircraft possessing characteristics seen defying known aerodynamic properties. Well, that's Sputnik News. I'm Emily Horn.
listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. It's almost unbelievable when you think that it's been 18 years since 9-11, 2001. No one will ever forget it. Indeed, it has shaped the international political landscape ever since. And looking into the future, it seems to me that it's obvious it will continue to do so. But there's still a lot that we don't know about 9-11, 2001. But Ian Henschel might, and he's coming up right after this. Have something to say? Do you disagree with George? Then call us now and give us your view. Now, Ian Henschel is one of the foremost UK researchers into the 9-11 attacks. He's the publisher also of Crisis Newsletter, as well as, and I like this one, www.dumpblair.com. Dot co dot uk and www.911dossier.co.uk. Now, uh, his original 9-11 Revealed in 2005 attracted praise from reviewers in the Daily Mail and the Sunday Times for the, quote, huge gaps uh, that it exposed in the official 9-11 story. Since then, the story has produced many sinister new twists. Now, let me put my own cards on the table before we ask Ian to play his. I'm not one of those who believes that the United States did 9-11 to themselves in order that they could then attack Iraq, Afghanistan and others. I don't believe they had any need to do so. If they had wanted to, they could have done so without this kind of a Pearl Harbor type catastrophe. Neither do I believe that Israel did it. Neither do I believe that Jews did it. Neither do I believe that it never happened. But I'll tell you what I do believe. I believe that there is a very whole lot that we don't know yet about 9-11 about who really did it, about who knew what and when. There are many, many questions unanswered, and the official 9-11 inquiry is as credible to me as the Warren Commission inquiry into the assassination of President Jack Kennedy, which is to say it has virtually no credibility at all. That's where I stand. Let's see where our guest stands. Ian Henschel is on the line now. Ian, thank you very much indeed for joining us on this anniversary. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, George. Now, give us your case, as it were, your take. What do you now say about 9-11-2001? Well, I think, as you said, we know so little um, about the details, and what we do know is highly suspicious um, in pointing towards, you know, somebody um, on, uh, who's supposed to have been under attack having in, in some way uh, allowed it to happen, maybe. Um, but as you say, you know, we really don't know. The 9-11 Commission was a complete waste of time and money, and since then, um, you know, that the, 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 there have been official reports, actually, George, which have been quite interesting. And George Tenet, the head of the CIA, was recommended for a punitive reprimand by an in inquiry, an internal inquiry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think what is new, you know, can, or what's come out in recent years, are these very bizarre activity of the CIA. Um, it turned out, we didn't know this at the time of 9-11, but it turned out that they had a whole department, a whole station, as they call it, dealing with only with Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the failure to detect the 9-11 attacks in advance 
given that they had something like something like 60 people all monitoring bin Laden, and incidentally they were tapping his phone that they, they, they could you know they knew they were getting his phone calls um, and yet they never acted. In fact, the FBI asked them at one point, they said, we're rather worried about these guys from Al-Qaeda who might be in America. CIA wouldn't tell them, didn't tell them anything about it. They were blocked. Somebody told the CIA to keep it under their hats. And of course, it would have stopped that. 9-11 would never have happened if these, uh, if these alleged terrorists had been, you know, arrested or even investigated properly. Quite so. I watched the uh, television uh, series, uh, The Looming Tower, uh, with which I was enormously impressed, written by a former CIA uh, operator uh, who was himself involved in those very turf wars uh, involving Tenet and others that you allude to. Uh, it's uh, passing strange uh, to the point of punitive uh, reprimand and uh, I think much more severe punishment at the very least that they did not stop this attack, or it might be yeah. even it might be even worse than that. Well, there could have been some junior people in the CIA, you know. I mean, maybe even senior people. Uh, Vice President Cheney, you know, is got stuck with sticking his nose in this quite a lot before 9/11 happened. Mm. And of course, you've got the project for a new American century, which said that without a new Pearl Harbor, it would take them years to sort of get their agenda of uh, militarization and um, occupation of Iraq. They, they, they said they wanted that. It's all public record stuff. Well, that's you right. Know, that, doesn't, wanted... that doesn't mean that they did it, uh, of course. Let, let, let's, no, turn, no. let's turn to some of the, uh, the specifics. Let's deal with the one that's most mysterious and most controversial. Uh, the the falling down of a building that wasn't even hit by the two aircraft. Tell us your view on that. I just can't. I mean, I'm not a you know I'm not a scientist, um, so you know everybody will take their own view. But it seems to me that the pure symmetry with which that building fell, and and the way uh, you know it it, it almost. In, Free fall speed. Well, it was free fall speed. It was free fall, yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, how could that have happened by sort of coincidence? Um, it, it, it's symmetrical. And, and you can see loads of pictures on the internet of a controlled demolitions. And then you can see a picture of World Trade Center 7 collapsing. And of course, it doesn't prove it, but it means that they should really be working quite hard to explain this. If they don't want people to be suspicious, mm. um, you know, and they don't want they, they say they don't like conspiracy theories. Well, quite often conspiracy theories happen when there isn't enough information, and you know, it ma this makes you wonder if uh, if they can't tell us any more because it would just confirm that it was a demolition of some sort. Yeah, I mean that's the the most mysterious. Uh, but the the Pentagon, uh, the lack of wreckage of an aircraft uh, at the front of the Pentagon was noted by me even live while I was watching it. It, it, it seemed extremely odd that an aircraft could uh, hit the Pentagon so cleanly in the front and then effectively disappear. Yeah. Well, the, ex the official explanation is the aluminium, and this is something a lot of 9-11 people don't know about, uh, but aluminium can actually burn itself. You know, it, 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 when you get to a certain heat, it becomes a combustible fuel of its own for a fire. Mm. Uh, and, of course, the other odd thing about the Pentagon attack is that, that you see that white flash. Now, I'm told by explosives experts that it shouldn't be a white flash. It should have been an orange flash. But, you know, once again, you're in the realm of technical expertise. Mm -hmm. I think what would be really interesting would be if some independent countries would run their own expert investigation into 9-11. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe we'd get some more clarity. You see, I'm, I'm in the position uh, of believing uh, bin Laden. Uh, bin Laden said that they had done this, and I see no reason to disbelieve him. I wrote that very afternoon, uh, an hour after the events, for the next day's Guardian. Uh, and I wrote that I'm, I don't need an inquiry. I'm in no doubt at all that this uh, series of terrorist attacks was carried out by people under the marching orders or at least motivated by the worldview 
of Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. I, I see no reason to doubt that, even now, even despite these questions that we are discussing here. But the question is, who was Osama bin Laden? Who was he working for? Why was yeah. he able to do this? And yet... Wittingly you know, or unwittingly. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, an organization that could pull off this the most sophisticated terrorist attack in history, but then went back to, you know, cutting people's heads off and uh, trying to blow up motor cars in Times Square. It, it, there seems something strange, inexplicably strange, about he got, their ability yeah, he to do a that. Bit of good luck, to, to say the least, um, he, he was, had a lucky shot, didn't he, with 9-11? And so many things could have so gone many wrong shots, for him. Though. Yeah, I mean, one lucky shot, but there was two lucky shots on the Twin Towers. There was another lucky shot on the Pentagon. That's three lucky that, shots. You don't often get that in life, Ian. That's right, and there's, there's quite a few more as well. When you look at how the, hij the alleged hijackers got into the country, they shouldn't have been let in. They were no. lucky as well. Uh, you know, so they, were lucky, you they were lucky that CIA didn't discover they were at flying school, or maybe they did discover it, just didn't know no, they what did. they were there for. Yeah, no, they discovered, well, one of the, 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 the Musawi, Zacharias Musawi, um, who's not considered to be one of the hijackers, is considered to be a reservist for the, for the team that carried out 9-11. And, and the CIA had got him. They, they, he'd been reported to them as somebody who wanted to fly, fly, excuse me, fly planes into the Twin Towers. Literally, that's what the CIA suspected. And they were told not to investigate any further. You know, uh, if they'd been allowed to investigate Musawi properly, 9-11 yeah. would never have happened. So yet another lucky coincidence. Another lucky shot. Uh, stay on the line, Ian, would you? Vincent is in South Wales, wants to ask you something. Vincent, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, George. I appreciate you allowing me on board. Welcome. Uh, Ian, uh, my question obviously is focusing just purely on the Pentagon. OK, as one of the four factors that happened on that so-called day. Right, the Pentagon. OK, so-called, we were told, an airliner crashed into the Pentagon. And all of the video evidence that we were shown, which is very limited, but quite close to the point of impact, shows no way could that be a commercial airliner making that point of impact that close to the ground and the grass does not have any marks on it whatsoever. And then the CIA, FBI confiscated all the video from the different establishments, commercial or not, within the area, never publicized. The whole 9-11 incident has more holes in it than a sieve or a colander. OK, thanks, so, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for that, Vincent. Ian, how do you respond to that? Well, that's what I, I thought that at one time, but I do actually think, I mean, for instance, there's a picture on the internet, which everybody who's interested in this has seen, which appears to show a small hole in the Pentagon wall, not large enough for a plane. Mm. Um, but actually, there is another picture, which is much rarer, which shows that that is the first floor and not the second, and not the basement. And the basement actually, well, sorry, the ground floor, excuse me, the ground floor was hit, um, you know, much more damage was done to it. So, and that is a consistent mm. with the plane. However, I think where I, where I certainly agree with the caller is that the, the, the alleged hijacker who apparently was flying that plane couldn't have carried off that manoeuvre. It was a very high speed ground level flight. As he says, you know, um, it hardly damaged the grass. Without hitting the, with, without hitting the ground before impact. Exactly. I mean, high speed ground level flying on, on, a, on a civilian airliner mm. is something which, you know, hardly any pilots in the world would be able to do, if anyone. Must have been a Let good... alone a, a, a guy that allegedly trained himself at flight school. Yeah. And the flight schools who trained Hani Hanjur, the, the alleged pilot, they said that he was totally incompetent, even on a small plane. And, and remember, these guys had to navigate as well. You know, plane, when they took over the planes, then, you know, the, the, the autopilot was set for the destination. They had to learn how to neutralize the autopilot and reset it for a completely different destination. That's not so easy. No, quite. Uh, the problem with Vincent's uh, apparent thesis is that 
that there was a plane that was hijacked and all of the people that were on it are now dead. Uh, to believe otherwise, you'd have to believe that that aeroplane was now on a South Sea atoll and all the people had been given new fake identities and the grief of their families was somehow falsified. And I can't I can believe that. It's certainly a stretch, isn't it? Um, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't 100% rule it out, because if you think about Operation Northwoods, mm -hmm. the Pentagon did think they could fake the disappearance of a plane that was yeah. supposed to be, you but, know, full yeah. of students. Again, they didn't so, do it, you, though. I, I can't see why we need to assume that in this case. It seems to me simply just to assume that the plane did hit the Pentagon and that the pictures, misleading pictures, possibly even, you know, that misinformation's being put out uh, to, to take, distract people from the real issues, which are the capability of the pilots and their good luck in, in getting into America and, you know, the success of, of their ghastly operation. Mm. Um, I think that's really the, the issue. And, of course, there are a lot of links that have now come out uh, involving Saudi Arabia. I mean, that is a huge chapter. Isn't that, um, really, the, isn't that really the reason for uh, the, uh, the cover-ups that there undoubtedly have been? The, uh, the redactions that were there even in the initial report, isn't it because it utterly exposes the United States' corrupt relationship uh, with the Saudi dictatorship? Well, absolutely. I mean, the CIA, if the CIA were pushed, the only possible excuse they could come up with is that they were hoodwinked by, the Saudi, by Saudi Arabia and they, mm. they, they made a sort of, um, they had a plan to uh, flip over, you know, recruit the people who were actually the hijackers and Saudi Arabia told them they could re be recruited. This is one of the theories that's going around now in, in CIA circles. Here's a, here's, that, um, here, here's a call on a not unrelated matter. Simon in Somerset. Go ahead, Simon. Hi there, George. Thanks for having us on there. Welcome. Um, Yes, um, well, yeah, just uh, another sort of kind of um, fact, really, that um, I'd like to bring up because it's very relative, is just something that I noticed that obviously the, the Bush family, when the American airspace was in fact actually shut for any uh, future sort of travel on the aftermath of the 9-11, um, that the Bush family actually allowed, um, for some reason, the jets to fly around uh, 10 cities in America, including uh, Los Angeles and, and Washington, D.C., to members of the Bin Laden family. Mm. They um, didn't just allow uh, it, Simon. They organized it. Well, precisely. So, mm. um, obviously, I, I don't know any factual sort of um, information in, in what would allow that sort of decision mm. to be made, but it certainly asks some, let's some hear what Ian, questions. Uh, really. let's, he let's hear what Ian thinks of that point. Ian? Yeah, well, it, it, it is highly it's troubling, very troubling indeed. And the orders did, apparently, you know, we're told that the orders did come from the Bush White House. And, of course, one reason that these Saudi, alleged Saudi hijackers come into the country was because the Bush White House had told their various agencies to go easy and make life easy for the Saudis. Now, once again, that doesn't prove anything by itself, but it's another, you know, it's another drip um, in, in the, of evidence. And, yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the New York Post has done some good stuff on this, actually, surprisingly. There's a journalist called Paul Sperry, and he found out that um, Bush and Prince Bandar, uh, who was the Saudi ambassador to Washington, were actually smoking cigars on, on, on the White House balcony, you know, the day after 9-11 and plotting the invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know... Well, he was so actually... close uh, that, that he called them, uh, they called him Bandar Bush. He could not yeah. literally have been closer to the Bush family if, uh, if he, ha he was, in fact, their brother. And now we, we've heard now that, uh, and this I think is pretty well established, you know, in the mainstream, uh, that Bandar's people were supporting some of the hijackers, some of the 9-11 hijackers. Mm. Uh, you know, they may not have known what they're up to. We, you know, that would be a separate issue, I guess. But they would definitely, they'd trace the money trail back to the Saudi am, am, am embassy, you know, that, that the money that some of those hijackers were getting and the support they were getting was coming uh, from the embassy. arrived in the States. Mm. Yeah, yeah, came out of the embassy. Simon, last word to you. Well, exactly. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not pretending like I have any um, magical answers, but there's far too many sort of um, questions, and I'm glad that it's brought to attention mm -hmm. again. And uh, thank you for your work and uh, bringing this. Uh, welcome, yeah, bringing welcome, this, this uh, Simon. Ian, that is the point, isn't it? Um, none of us are disrespecting the enormous loss of life suffered by the United States and many foreign people who were 
caught up in these events. Uh, an ocean of blood was shed uh, by whoever did this. But we are entitled to ask for better answers than we've got so far, aren't we? Yeah, of course we are. And, and look at the horrors that have happened since as a result of 9-11. You know, I mean, the, probably the most horror for me is, is that the CIA was given approval to torture people, which meant, of course, that they could get any story they want out, because when you torture people, they'll say anything you want them to mm. say. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, that's one. And then you've got the invasion of Iraq. Well, it's almost, got 20, Americans... almost 20 years of war. That's right, it is. And it did change everything. The media were right about that. It changed everything. That's what they said at the time. And by Jove, they were right. Um, it even helped out George Bush personally at home because he was very unpopular at that point. You know, he'd rigged the Florida elections. Well, there was, you know, a lot of controversy about it. And it went to the Supreme Court. And, and he was only just made president by the Supreme Court. And the, and the recounts from Florida, the checks on the votes were going to come out. And without 9-11, it would have turned out that Bush actually should never have been given the Florida um, mandate. You yeah. know, and he wouldn't have been president. So, you know, wh whichever direction you look in, it was a disaster for humanity. And it will go on being a disaster until the truth is told about it. Uh, Ian, how do people follow your work? Uh, well, they can send an email to Crisis Newsletter at pronet. .co.uk. Go to our website, reinvestigate911.org. That's probably the best way, reinvestigate911.org. By the way, we're leafleting outside the BBC on, um, on Wednesday, uh, 4.30 outside the BBC in Portland Place. What so time? If wants to come what down, time? Uh, 4.30 in the afternoon on Wednesday. at the BBC Portland Place office on Wednesday. Um, Ian, there's a lot of support for this, you know, I mean, there's a lady on the Daily Mail who's very bravely investigated some of these things, mm. um, Sue Reed, you know, so we're not a million miles from getting somewhere, and the courts in America have now opened up to the issue, they're, they're doing their own investigations, so, you know, this is not a hopeless case, and the, you know, the, the, the benefits of the truth coming out, and the truth is definitely, beyond any doubt, the truth is that they could have stopped 9-11, um, given a few differences. Yeah. We don't know quite why they didn't. Could stop have, it. could That's have, and uh, could have, and why didn't they? That's the yeah. sixty-four thousand dollar question, isn't it? Ian, it's been a yeah. pleasure talking to you. Thanks very much, and the best of luck on Wednesday with your protest outside the BBC. This really is the mother of all talk shows. Breaking news, expert analysis, and exclusive stories, all in one place. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Radio Sputnik, we speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Tune in every Friday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for a weekly segment of the worst mainstream media headlines of the week. They tell us what's behind the worst, most misleading, and funniest headlines from around the news with Steve Pat of the blog Left Eye on the News. Together, they pull apart the corporate media's bias, spin, and downright lies. Tune in this Friday and every Friday for the worst and most misleading headlines of the week. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Well, 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 the uh, social media and so on is flooding in. Dakota says, do you feel, sir, that since the no deal legislation passed both houses in Parliament, could Johnson ignore it in dealing with negotiations in terms of Brexit. Stormhawk says Boris Johnson, elitist, Etonian, bone idol, rich boy who loathes the working class. Matt Brannigan says leaving with no deal is suicide, especially for us in what he calls Northern Ireland. Declan says I'm in class, Master Galloway. Give Ireland back to the Irish and the problems of Brexit will be solved. Declan. You're right in one. Valiant Stallion says, Britain has become ever, ever more evident under the influence of the EU and the USA for the mere fact that the people really have no say. Referendum after referendum until the elites get their way. 
Bob Kraft says the referendum ceased to be binding when the promises fell apart and all that was left was no deal. That's a novel one, Bob. Leila Victoria says you are the only man I know with a public platform who speaks the truth. Indeed, straightforward, straight talking. The world needs more Galloways. Thank you, Leila. Neon Knights says even Tories are abandoning their beloved party in droves, calling it out as crazed right-wing extremism. So why, George, do you continue supporting Bojo's Brexit dictatorship? Hashtag stop the coup. Your problem's not with me, Neon Knights. It's with the 35% of the population uh, who, in today's opinion poll, are going to vote for Boris Johnson, as opposed to the 21% who are going to vote for Labour. So there's, you can make yourself feel better by insulting me, by distorting what it is that I'm saying, but it won't butter many parsnips when the election comes. That I can tell you. Now, one of the things that had the left, in quotes, jumping for joy, dancing with glee, was when Boris Johnson's brother, Joe, of whom most people in the country were entirely oblivious, walked out of a job in the cabinet that nobody knew that he had, giving rise to a thousand memes. Why should we trust you when your own brother doesn't trust you, and all of that kind of thing. Many of those seem to have forgotten that actually there is some precedent for this. David and Ed Miliband. One of those didn't just walk out of the other's cabinet. One of those actually stood against his brother in a leadership election and defeated him. Now, of the two, obviously I preferred Ed to David, but I'm an old-fashioned sort of guy. And in the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's kind of biblically off when one brother, politically speaking, murders another. It's kind of normal that younger brothers and sisters support their older brother and sister, but neither the Milibans nor the Johnsons appear to have that in their DNA. Dr. Terry Apter, PhD, is a psychologist, writer, and is a former senior tutor at Newnham College, Cambridge. Her books on family dynamics, identity, and relationships have received international acclaim. She has presented her research on children and teenagers' motivation to the Sutton Trust and to Her Majesty's Treasury. Her book about teenagers and parents in conversation, You Don't Really Know Me, was the basis of an editorial in The Guardian, the lead story in the review section of The Independent on Sunday, as well as op-eds in The Times, The Glasgow Herald, the Toronto Star, and the Boston Globe. She has presented her work at the Oxford Literary Festival, the Edinburgh Literary Festival, and the ICA. Her most recent book, The Sister Knot, that's K-N-O-T, is a finalist for a Books for a Better Life Award 2008. Terry also reviews fiction and new publications in social sciences for the Times Literary Supplement and she's kindly agreed to join us this evening. Dr. Terry, thanks for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Tell me this, um, what is it about political families on the left and on the right, the Milibans and the Johnsons, that they think nothing of, well, metaphorically, stabbing their own siblings in the back? They're not necessarily stabbing a sibling in the back. They're competing with a sibling, and this is something we all do. Yes, of course, we're supposed to love our siblings and support them, and often we do. There's a great family identi 
identification. So, you know, they can make us really proud when they do well, and they can make us ashamed when they do badly. But as well as being a companion and an ally, they're also a competitor. I mean, this is what we feel when we, a new sibling comes along. And, of course, it's not only in the political field. You also get the Williams sisters. Serena and uh, Venus have often have sometimes had to play finalists finals together uh, against each other. And then you had the Brownlee brothers who were some years ago racing against each other. So, you know, you, you have um, siblings who have the same interests who have the same talents, that isn't unusual, and often you will find them competing with one another just as they did when they were toddlers and they were fighting over parents' attention and love and admiration. So it's not just a political thing, and it's not really unusual. I think we're very we're fascinated by it when we see it in the uh, public stage because it's something we most of us have dealt with already. And what's so interesting, though, when you talk about the Milibands, is how uh, Boris Johnson responded to that, what he said, his comments, when the Milibands were standing yes, against Yes, he the said this other. was a very left-wing thing. Could never happen to him. It could never happen to him. He said it's a left-wing thing only lefties can think about like that because they see people as discrete agents. They're devoid of ties to society or to each other. And then, you know, bizarrely, he said that's how Stalin could murder 20 million people. That, that, that's a non sequitur, but nonetheless what he's saying is, um, you know, you, you, have to have, you have to have a good family, sense of a clan, sense of a togetherness. Uh, the, the conservatives have this, the lefties don't. But, and I think that is what has shocked uh, the current prime minister so much about his brother leaving. You know, he, he, Boris is someone who has gotten away with a lot because he's he has charm. He can tell people who have learned not to trust him, don't worry. You know, he can charm them out of their distrust or dismay, and he's gotten away with it. He may have had a lot of, um, you know, personal relationships sort of ruined along the way, but the clan, the family, um, all of those Johnson siblings, he's felt that they are pretty much, they are pretty close and safe. And so when uh, Joe Johnson left with, a, with an understated but really barbed comment saying, I had to choose, not, not simply I disagree with my brother, it was known that they disagreed. What he said was, I had to choose between being loyal to my brother and caring about the national interest. So that's a really barbed thing. He couldn't yeah, be loyal damning, yeah. to his brother and care about the national interest. Mm -hmm. um, and that is said to have really rattled um, Boris Johnson. But it's also thought that the reason Joe Johnson felt this is the final straw, I can't continue to support my brother, I can't continue to stand beside him, is that his brother then expelled... 21 loyal party um, MPs. And so these were people who were part of a clan, and he ousted them. And so that gave Joe Johnson the, you know, the, the energy, the impulse, the motive to say, okay, I've stood by you, we've been a clan, but if you are disrupting the conservative family in this way, then I have to step away from you, and um, you know I'm not going to have, I'm I'm not going to have, be politically matched to you mm. anymore. Well, you wait years uh, for uh, such things, and then three come along at once because just this very day, Jeremy Corbyn's brother is attacking Jeremy Corbyn. This is Piers Corbyn, the weatherman. Uh, he has denounced his brother's Brexit policy uh, and, uh, and is, has moved into open opposition, uh, public opposition to it. So 
you must be right when you say it's uh, actually relatively common. Well, it is common. I think however much siblings love one another, they're always looking out for the pecking order. And I think that sometimes one of the secrets of living in harmony with a sibling is certainly admiring them and supporting them, but also having some little secret sense that in some important ways you are superior to them. And it's much more difficult to have this when one uh, sibling, you know, is in the limelight, seems to be very successful, uh, and it um, can be very tempting just to want to put a pin in, in the balloon of their ego, just as you did when they were kids. Mm. I mean, in this case, I mean, Piers Corbin is the older brother, uh, Boris Johnson is the older brother, and David Miliband uh, was the uh, older brother. Uh, so maybe it's also about this pecking order point that you make. Last question, if I may, Doctor. Uh, where does this place the mother of these siblings? Or, or, or the father, um, the Miliband father had passed away. Uh, God rest him, I knew him well, a very great man. Uh, I also know Mr. Uh, Mr. Johnson's uh, father. Uh, yeah. where, where does it place the parent? How do the parents handle such a thing? There you have two children in the cabinet, and one of them just walked out in the most damaging way possible. Well, I think for um, the Miliband, if, if I were the Miliband's mother, you know, I'd be um, proud, <laughs> I'm immensely proud of both of them. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, well, one of them will survive, but whoever doesn't get the uh, leadership will still be okay, you know, because a parent sees them um, not only uh, on a one-item basis of who is winning this competition, but more, just more generally. Um, I think with, I think uh, the Johnson father is clearly trying to step away from it and saying, I don't talk about politics and, you know, I'm not going to be drawn into that, this, I'm not going to say anything. I think what he would like is to think that they still do have that family togetherness, that this is just a political thing and we can forget it. I think for the two of them, uh, Boris Johnson and Joe Johnson at this time, it is not uh, something that can will just go away. Um, it, it's, well, no, it, it, it definitely didn't with the Milibans. Uh, it, it will never go away, I think. But their sister, the Johnson sister, also stood against the yes. Conservatives in the, uh, yes. in the European Parliament elections. So there's not much togetherness to begin with. Well, I, she has a right to her view, and I think standing um, for a different party is saying, I have a different view. It's not as barbed as walking out mm. of a, you know, a cabinet and Quite saying so. what you said yeah. about your brother. So that is, that, that, that is shafting him. And it will be interesting, you know, um, we, we, we can look on this in years to come and think uh, what will happen. Maybe Joe Johnson will uh, rise um, in politics mm. and we'll see uh, Boris Johnson shuffling along. Um, <laughs> an old man in and the House of uh, Lords. curry favor with his brother. Well, look, Dr. Terry Apta, thank you very much for that, uh, that angle that you have uh, really exposed on the issue of sibling rivalry in politics and indeed in tennis and running. I've got Lizzie, a legend in Gloucester on the line, but I better take a quick break first. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Tune in Tuesdays to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for Women in Society with Professor Hannah Dickinson, where we talk about the major issues, challenges, and struggles facing women in all aspects of society. Hannah Dickinson, professor and organizer with the Geneva Women's Assembly, joins the show this Tuesday and every Tuesday on Loud and Clear. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down.
Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Well, the wonderful Elena is with me now uh, to give me some social media feedback, but there is a legend on the line, and nothing can hold back a legend. It's Lizzie in Gloucester. Lizzie, welcome to the show. Hi, George. Hi. How are you? Very good, thanks. Good. Well, I, first of all, I was going to talk to you about your terrible stance on Brexit, but before that, I thought I'd have a word in answer to sibling rivalry. Yeah, go I ahead. Mean, you mentioned, Pier, well, I don't know if you mentioned it or the I doctor. I did, I did, yeah. Piers Corbyn. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's a climate change denier like Trump. So him being Does against... that invalidate his uh, criticism? <laughs> <laughs> it it doesn't invalidate his opinion. Uh, his criticisms can be questioned, though, <laughs> mm. I think. Yeah. And Joe's dad, um, I think he'd be equally proud of all his three children. Has he got three children? I think I Joe... think more, actually. I think more. Oh, the, think... There's the woman who stood for the Change UK, whatever happened to them. Uh, there's Joe <laughs> and Boris, but I'm, I'm sure there's more. We, we, well, we must brace ourselves for the possibility that there may well, be I'm, more. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's anything like Boris, there may be babies all over the place. Uh, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> that's right. There's quite a few uh, Johnson uh, progeny acknowledged <laughs> and unacknowledged. Well, I think Joe's dad will be equally proud. I think it's called covering all, all your bases. I mean, he's got... Joe yeah, can yeah they're, they're, they're well, betting on every colour on the uh, roulette table. They are. Once Boris has uh, made, uh, made his platform as Prime Minister or, or fa fallen into the abyss yeah. or the ditch, pro pro preferably the ditch will be underneath the raspberry uh, canes in Jeremy Corbyn's allotment, and then we can have some nice jam. Elaborate, but good, good. Anyway, <laughs> tell, me, tell me how I'm wrong about Brexit. Right, well, the thing is, you see, I'm, I'm neither for nor against Brexit, as you may remember. I do, yes. I'm not, I think that we, as people, will cope admirably either way. Uh, but what we really need is some decent people in government, whoever they are. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not saying all Labour are decent, because they're definitely you, not. You, you could hardly do so. Yes. And ask, I'm, your mate, I'm not... ask your mate, Chris Williamson. <laughs> well, you know, you know as well as I do how well, you know, Labour has coped with the anti-Semitism. That's one other thing. Why didn't they use that against Ed Miliband? Why did they come up with the bacon sarnie face? Mm -hmm. You know, well, because they, it's they because it's entirely cynical. Uh, they care. Yeah. The people who mounted this campaign have absolutely no care for the actual interests and the peace of mind of Jewish people in Britain. This, this story is an invention. It's an invention yeah. to destroy Jeremy Corbyn. And as someone wrote today, uh, David Gaber, I think, uh, it is itself an anti-Semitic act. You're putting the blame on Britain's Jewish people for what might happen next uh, to Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, you, you could hardly get a more anti-Semitic uh, act than that. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it, it never existed in most people's minds. It never existed prior to Jeremy Corbyn becoming leader of the Labour Party, even after that. Well, quite so. Um, Look, uh, uh, Ed Miliband and David Miliband contested the Labour leadership in 2015. Uh, uh, sorry, in uh, uh, 2010, it must have been, uh, 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 both as Jews. Now, Lab nobody displayed a scintilla of hostility no. towards either of them because Absolutely. they were 
choose the either loved one of them or hated one of them because of their politics. Exactly. And I think that's exactly the case now, but it's used under a different, it's under a different banner, isn't it? Mm, mm. But I think that um, you supporting um, Brexit, no deal or, or any deal, mm. uh, a good deal preferably, mm -hmm. is, is, I think is beside the point. Because really, without good people in government, mm -hmm. and really, mm -hmm. Jeremy Corbyn is our only hope of good people in yes, government. Yes, well, uh, uh, let me accept I that. I know he's surrounded by Blair, yeah, so... Well, uh, uh, you know, I could go into that all night, but yeah, let me accept that goodbye. point. Let me accept <laughs> that point. I'm saying to you that he is much, much less likely to be the Prime Minister because of Labour's Brexit policy. Except for the fact that the, La the Brexit policy was voted on by members of the Labour Party at last year's conference. Lizzie, what does that matter? When you become leader... Lizzie, what will, that matter in, uh, what will that matter historically? If, well, Labour, if Labour goes down to a crushing defeat, do you think anyone suffering under the DWP or suffering under the bombs that are yet to fall will be saying, oh, well, he had to because a group of middle-class waitrose delegates to the Labour Party conference managed to get a result one way or another in the conference? Lizzie, that's pettifogging detail. The big picture is that five million Labour voters voted leave, and there's a very real danger of all or part of them not voting Labour again because of it. But, but when you become leader of a party, don't you have to become the voice of the people in that party? Well, are you the voice of the members or are you the voice of the voters? Oh, are well. you the voice of the workers? Are you the voice of millions of workers? Or are you the voice of a couple of hundred middle-class dancers at a Labour Party conference? Well, as, as the Tory party have shown, it's, it's about standing together in the party, isn't it? And that's the way well, politics have always been. It's not, my, to... it's not my way, but, but whether it's your way or my way, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And the eating takes place on election day. And trust me, if <laughs> Labour go down to a big defeat, it will matter not a jot that Corbyn was following to the letter a policy decided by a Labour Party conference one day in Blackpool. I agree with that, I agree with that, but I also, I also think that um, if, if he manages to put the election off until after bre we've Brexited, after we've left the EU, ah, well, then now you're the talking. Brexit Party aren't, aren't a part of the equation, are yeah, they? Now you're talking, that's what I'm calling for. Yes. That's what I, that. that was my opening remarks. <laughs> it's screamingly obvious the best thing from your party point of view is to let Boris Brexit and then blame him for any problems associated with it. Yes, which will actually be his responsibility. Well, quite. So why not let him do it? Why are you moving heaven and earth to stop him from doing it? Well, I, d I don't know he's saying a lot of things in the mainstream media, but uh, if you actually listen to what he's saying, then uh, perhaps not, because like you say, not many people are listening to what he's saying, Jeremy Corbyn, are they? I, I actually don't remember the last time I heard him saying anything. It's Watson, Starmer and MacDonald and yes. Thornbury, epically, epically Thornbury, who, th who Thornburyed herself on BBC Question Time uh, on Thursday night. Lizzie, you're a legend still. Pleasure to disagree with you. But I'm under pressure of time. And the wonderful Elena is with me. Elena, uh, how is it going, first of all? We're getting a lot. Yeah, well, again, as always, we're a very international program. Yeah. So we've got people from UK, US, Austria, China, France, Palestine, Scotland. China also, yeah? S yeah, Scotland, Canada, Iran. So quite a few different places, very unexpected. Touching all bases. Yeah. <laughs> um, as you can expect, loads of comments on Brexit. Is it mainly Brexit um, or has 9-11 got no, anything? No, you know, 9-11 got a few comments. Mm. Even Boris and um, his brother's Joe's relationship yeah. got a few as well. So people... What's are... the balance then on the, on the Brexit? Um, well, people are saying that what's going on right now is laughable. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite a lot of support for Corbyn. 
Um, someone is saying that he's the best option for us right now. Um, you've got a question actually about Corbyn. Mm. Um, George, you've outlined Labour's Brexit problem. What's mm. your solution for Corbyn? Uh, well, I gave him one, uh, actually, a year and a half ago, and it was this. Tell the people that you are respecting the result, uh, that you will not block the Brexit, but you will seek to renegotiate the terms, and you'll put whatever terms you get to a yes-no referendum uh, in, the, uh, in the eventuality that you get one and you are the Prime Minister. That would have been the best policy for Labour. That's the policy Harold Wilson followed. Got him out of a jam. Uh, it, it meant that Wilson had to ride two horses at the same time. But as he said, if you can't ride two horses at the same time, you shouldn't be in the circus. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jeremy Corbyn has turned his face against that screamingly obvious uh, point. Let Boris Johnson Brexit. Then take the brickbats for any problems associated with it and say, if you put a Labour government in, I will renegotiate the terms and put it back to you. But the referendum would have to be between the Boris Johnson terms and the Jeremy Corbyn terms. It can't be with remain on the ballot paper because that is not respecting the result of the original referendum. That's my policy. I've advocated it publicly, openly for a long time now. So you don't think it's too late for him to change his mind now? It is too late, yeah. Mm. It is. Uh, he's, and he's not going to. Uh, it, it is too late, but in any case, he's not even going to try it. So Labour is stuck with the policy enunciated by Emily Thornberry on Question Time on Thursday night to uh, a laughing stock. The entire audience laughed. Oh, how they laughed. And th up and down the country, people must have been shaking their heads in amazement. What kind of a policy is that? Elect me, I'll go and renegotiate a deal, I'll bring it back to you, and I'll be campaigning against my own deal. Mm. I literally have never heard of such a thing in any country at any time. Sorry, I'm putting you off. No, 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 it's like... I'm mesmerized with you because it's I, I agree it's very undemocratic what's going on right now and loads of people online also saying the same thing mm. um, so there is a question from Barbara she's asking why are you so friendly with Farage I, I haven't seen Farage in years what, what do you mean friendly with Farage I voted for his party once in the farcical elections earlier this year for the rubber stamp European Parliament that shouldn't even exist I have not seen Nigel Farage in almost four years or spoken to him on the telephone. Why am I so friendly with Farage? You see, people see what they want to see. They believe what they want to believe. They infer that which is not a fair inference. Sorry. <laughs> she stroke a cord there, didn't she? <laughs> um, so there is... Um again loads of comments on Boris and Joe and someone is saying in my experience if you believe your siblings are on your side you probably haven't spent enough time with them yeah <laughs> well that might be true but yeah. don't you have a right to expect your younger brother whom you've given a cabinet post to who knew your views and what you were going to do when he took the cabinet post aren't you entitled to expect he'll not walk out in the most damaging way at the most damaging time uh, because he's your brother. I, I kind of think you are entitled to expect that. I don't hold with the, the doctor was very liberal uh, about these things. Everyone has the right, and of course they do democratically. But in terms of family, uh, I could never do, for example, what Hillary Benn does. Mr. Benn, the late Mr. Benn, was the leader of the Brexit tendency in British politics for 40 years and more. And his son is the leader of the wreck Brexit. I couldn't do that even if my father had passed on because as a religious believer, I, I, I assume, hope, that I'll meet my father again one day uh, in the other life. And how would I explain that? Dad, I micturated over everything you ever stood for. <laughs> Just 
I wouldn't like to have to face that. But I am old-fashioned, as I said. Maybe get some more from you later. Yes, for sure. This is the mother of all talk shows. Breaking news, expert analysis, and exclusive stories, all in one place. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Hi, this is Max Kaiser, and I'm with Stacey Herbert, and we're doubling down. Yeah, we're doubling down on crazy. We're doubling down on our new show called Double Down on Sputnik. It's doubling down on absolute joyous radio nirvana. You will love it. You will want to listen to every single episode on Sputnik. Bye, y'all. <laughs> Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at sputniknews.com. Sputnik News. Taliban leaders in Afghanistan have vowed to make the United States suffer after Donald Trump canceled peace talks which were due to take place today. The U.S. president tweeted yesterday that he had been set to meet Afghan President Ashraf Ghani and Taliban negotiators, but he canceled the secret meeting due to take place at his Camp David retreat after the Taliban admitted that they were behind a recent attack in Kabul which killed a U.S. soldier. In a statement in response, Taliban spokesperson Zabihala Majid said the talks had been going well until Saturday. Pulling out of the peace process before the signing of the agreement because of one explosion shows the U.S.'s lack of maturity and experience, he added. He also maintained that the Taliban and the Afghan government had agreed to talks on September 23rd, although the Afghan government has not confirmed this. A face-to-face -face meeting with the Taliban at Camp David, the site of past historic peace negotiations, would have been an extraordinary diplomatic move by the U.S. president, especially as it would have come just ahead of the 18th anniversary of 9-11. President Trump is also being investigated by a U.S. congressional committee over a potential conflict of interest over military spending at a Scottish airport near his luxury golf resort. The House Oversight Committee alleges that military expenditure at Presswick Airport in Scotland has increased considerably since the president came into office. The debt-ridden airport was bought by the Scottish government for one pound and it's close to Trump's Turnberry Golf Resort. The airport is said to be integral to the Trump business, which is also loss-making. The committee's accusations are detailed in a letter to the Pentagon, which is dated in June, but was only revealed on Friday. The letter requests access to all communications between the U.S. Department of Defense Defense and Trump Turnberry, as well as any related financial records. According to various reports in the U.S. media, the department has not yet complied with the demands. It is also not commented directly, and neither has the Trump Organization. Next, Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson has suffered another resignation from his government over Brexit. Work and Pensions Minister Amber Rudd has quit Johnson's cabinet with an outspoken attack on the government's approach over leaving the European Union. She claimed that there were no formal negotiations between Britain and the EU over a leaving with a deal. She claimed that there was very little evidence the government would get a new Brexit deal and she had only received a one-page summary of efforts to get an agreement when she asked for details earlier last week. She said proper discussions about policy had not been taking place, suggesting senior ministers had limited involvement in the PM's decisions. However, Chancellor of the Exchequer responded that ministers were straining to get a deal with the EU. He said the government has many new ideas for proposals to break the deadlock over the contentious backstop plan and the deal previously agreed between Theresa May's government and the EU aimed at preserving the seamless border on the island of Ireland. The deal has been rejected three times by the UK House of Commons. He also claimed it would be madness to talk through the details of the government's proposals openly. 
And finally, a senior U.S. senator is claiming that the U.S. Navy is withholding information about the sighting of UFOs. Mark Walker of North Carolina, a member of the Intelligence and Counterterrorism Subcommittee, said that he was frustrated that his inquiries were not being properly answered by the Navy over what he described as the threat superior aircraft flying in U.S. airspace may pose. He claimed that sightings and footage taken by U.S. pilots and other personnel on warships revealed unknown aircraft possessing characteristics seemingly defying known aerodynamic properties. Well, that's Sputnik News. I'm Emily Horn. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. You're watching the mother of all talk shows, and I've been joined by the cleverest man in England. It's hashtag Ask Adam. And the last hour, as always, is over to you. You can ask me, you can ask Adam, or you can phone just to ventilate your own views and your own frustration. It doesn't have to be a question, but if it is a question, here's how you convey it. First of all, the US number, 001-757-744-4480. The UK number, 0207-798-2255. Or you could tweet me, at George Galloway, at RTUK News, at GG Motes at as many of us as you can helps to spread the word and if you are watching on facebook as thousands of you i know are please make sure you share with all of your friends you can also watch on my youtube channel george galloway official adam welcome back uh, to the show it's been quite a week <laughs> I mean, a week like no other, really, would you say? Well, as uh, Paul McCartney would say, held to skelter, even though at times it felt more like Charlie Manson's uh, infamous version, so to speak. But it's, it's been one of the more prolific weeks in British politics. And if anyone had any doubt that Brexit is the most serious issue, the most cataclysmic issue that this country has faced since 1945, I don't think that any doubters were left in the wake of the week that was. Well, there seem to be some still. Uh, there are people, I spoke to one today, uh, quite a, a, an, an eminent uh, person, mm. uh, who entertains the belief, hope, but also belief, that Labour can move this coming election away from Brexit, not, of course, parking Brexit, it's far too big to park, but can deflate its salience in the campaign and get people talking about what will be a raft of policies on everything else from Labour that would be very good for the people of this country if they were implemented. That's Labour's hope. Is it a, a, a forlorn hope? I think a wish would be a better way to describe it. Brexit is the central issue because it affects all the others. It affects the economy. It affects the currency. It affects trade and the very ability to trade. It affects migration. Uh, it affects the way that the country interacts diplomatically with others. It affects the way that Britain has a relationship with the United States because Donald Trump's administration is very clear about its position on Brexit. As to be fair, so was Barack Obama who famously helped the Brexit campaign by, by insulting us, by, by Britain. By insulting us, yeah. yes. And, and so it is the issue. And I'm sorry, but regular service is not going to resume until Brexit is complete. Well, you see, that seems to me such a screamingly obvious point. Quite so. Uh, it's inexplicable how Labour got itself into this position. Uh, and it can only be explained uh, by virtue of the absolute obeisance to EU membership of the uh, majority of the Labour MPs and the majority actually of the shadow cabinet because if you were looking at this, if you, if you had no view on it and you were looking at this merely as a chess game, mm. you would allow Johnson to take that piece because you would know your chances of winning the game thereafter are greater 
once he's taken that piece. But if you make the entire game about that piece, then you're going to be the loser. In Labour Party terms, they are going to be the loser from their uh, failure to allow the British people's decision to be implemented. Well, it's a bit like a dwarf trying to challenge Michael Jordan at basketball as opposed to challenging him to subterranean subterfuge where a lack of height is actually an asset. You really couldn't make it up that Labour are now doing everything they can to lose the next election, not least because what is the Labour Party if not a party of working people and those who have been sent out of work against their will by this so-called deindustrialization, the rape of the fruits of modernity that made this country great. And in places where that has happened, in the North, in the Midlands, in South Wales, Labour are going to find that the Brexit Party, not the Tories, mind you, but the Brexit Party, are going to give them a short, sharp shock during the next election. I fear you're right, and fear is the word, because I'm obviously a, a Labour man. I have been all my life. I'm loyal to the Labour idea, mm. but that doesn't mean I can be uh, dragooned into being loyal to a policy I think is fundamentally wrong. Well, look, parties come and go and countries come and go. If there was someone who was loyal to the USSR, let's say, not because they loved Russian culture, but because they loved communism, being loyal to the Russia before 1917 or after 1991 wouldn't make a lot of sense. Same if you were a Maoist. China's not a Maoist country anymore. It's living in a shadow cast not by Mao, but by Deng Xiaoping. And so people of that labor persuasion need to ask themselves, is is this party really what I believe? And I think that people in the North and the Midlands and the other industrial parts of England and Wales will look at Labour and they'll say this is an Islington clique of people yeah. from the middle class, from universities, who care more about imported organic food from the south of France and some sort of a, a multi-denominational sex holiday in Italy where Tiberius used to go for his adventures like that in the first century and they're gonna say what on earth does this have to do with the brass bands of Yorkshire what does it have to do with the decimated but once great automotive motor industry of the Midlands and the steel industry of the Midlands what does it have to do with the miners who once worked in Wales I don't see how there's any point of connectivity between this snobbish liberal cosmopolitan elitism and working-class values there's no connection at all frankly well uh uh, I do think the London centrism yeah. uh, of today's Labour Party is a major problem here. Uh, almost all of the top leaders of the Labour Party uh, have London constituencies. In fact, they're more or less all next door to each other <laughs> uh, in, in North London. Quite uh, so. And it helps to buttress this bubble. Uh, that if you're living in London all the time, you don't have a Northern or Midlands constituency to go back to. You never hear what I'm hearing. I, I'm in the black country in the West Midlands every week. Uh, so I hear what the people are saying there. But if you're the MP for Islington, you don't. Uh, and uh, ditto Twitter. As I said earlier uh, in the opening of the show, if this election were fought on Twitter and in London, Labour would win it. Quite so. But unfortunately for them, it isn't going to be for in either. Absolutely right, and I think that people need to realize that politics isn't about theory. Theor theorists write about politics after it's happened, but politicians have to respond to events as they are happening, and the more action-minded men and women among the political class will actually go out of their way to shape the present in order for it to inform the future. These people all seem to be these theoretical types, which indeed it's common on uh, common in London, common on Twitter, but it, it isn't speaking to the feelings that people have. And people need to realize that, oh, one of the epithets that this liberal lot like to throw at Brexit is, oh, it was only an emotional vote. People in that, of that frame of mind don't understand that emotion frequently informs and gives the locomotion which drives ideas and which drives pragmatism. These people are so out of touch that I think it's going to be a good electoral 
or are hiding that maybe, maybe might just wake them up to how out of touch they really are. I think it'll more likely uh, reshape, break and then reshape the I, I think for uh, John McTernan, who used to work for Tony Blair, who's a friend of mine, made the point uh, that referenda change the political scene mm. for 30 years after uh, the referendum took place. Especially when the status quo loses. Yes. People are uh, identify themselves. So, for example, in Scotland, uh, about 45% of the people identify themselves as leavers, as uh, supporters of separation, of independence. Uh, and about 55% of them identify as part of Britain. Uh, and that's despite the different parties that they mon might once have voted for. And that's likely to continue. And I think it's happening with Brexit now. Let's take a call uh, from San Francisco from Tom. Go ahead, Tom. Hey, guys. How you doing? Great to hear hey, from man. you. Go ahead. Lovely to talk with you. I appreciate you taking the call. Um, Welcome. Compliments on your most eloquent presentation every week. I look forward to tuning in. Thanks, Tom. Um, I have a quick question outside of where the heck do I get hold of one of them Yorkshire tea mugs. Um, <laughs> the question relates to the City of London. Um, I've been reading a little bit about it, and the City of London, as I understand it, it is not technically part of what we know as London on a map. Mm -hmm. um, I'm referring to the financial centre. Yes. Um, it's kind of changing shapes as we move towards the Brexit event. And um, I've noticed just visiting where I come from, Dublin, Ireland, that's my home, um, a lot of the banking folks are moving to there. They've actually acquired property as of the referendum date in the UK. Mm -hmm. they, they literally next week started moving towards um, securing property there. Yep. What do you guys see happening there in terms of how that will affect um, the actual city of London? Very good, very good um, question, Tom. And uh, by the way, I was granted the freedom of the city of San Francisco on the steps of the town hall, city hall, for my work on Ireland. How about that then? Uh, now, Adam. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's one of my proudest possessions. And I thought I knew all of the merits and laurels that you've that's, uh, received over that, this. That's a that, new one for that's me. That's a new one, yeah. Uh, um, what do you say? Well, the Republic of Ireland has been courting international business for quite a few decades now. The Celtic Tiger, which awoke during the 1990s, achieved its status in great part because corporation tax in Ireland is incredibly more favourable than it's been in Britain under both recent Labour and recent Conservative governments. So this trend of companies like Google and other big tech firms, especially from the United States, having the Europe European base in Ireland is nothing new. It's a place where it's generally friendly to Americans. Many Americans have Irish background. It's an English-speaking country, high standard of education. So I don't see anything particularly shocking about that. As for the City of London, the City of London did uh, vote overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. Most big corporations and their owners, Richard Branson, who I have a great deal of fun at his expense on Twitter, uh, he was outspoken for the European Union when he wasn't, of course, saying that Venezuela should have an illegal coup, so much for the rule of law, uh, Dick. Uh, and, and he lives on his own island in the Caribbean. Quite. I don't know how the hurricane has, has treated him, but hurricane Brexit is what I've been <laughs> pay, paying attention but, to. But Tom's point, uh, you know, is in a way uh, posited on the belief that uh, the city of London is a good thing. I'm one of these people, I've got to tell you, that doesn't think the city of London is a good thing. Not for the democratic reason that Tom mentions, though that is one of the reasons, that actually it is an island uh, entire unto itself. It is not governed uh, by the London Assembly. It's a corporation, literally. It's, it's literally a corporation. Uh, but because our economy, since we joined the European Union, has been forever bent towards the finance capital sector. And all the things that we uh, built before and no longer build uh, are somehow supposed to be compensated for by the fact that, I don't know, 100,000 people, let's call it that, are uh, playing uh, gambling on casinos and on computers in the city of London. 
that's not an economy to me. Oh, I totally agree. I'm a gold standard man, and under the gold standard, you can't have this kind of piratical finance capitalism, because when money means something, speculation isn't a way to make money and to take money and to lose money and then to get bailed out by the government with more of this fake money. But I will say this. Those who assume that the city of London is going to fall by the wayside because of Brexit and all of these other horror stories, let's put it in perspective. Active. There are uh, over a hundred independent nation states throughout the world today, only 28 of which, including Britain for now, are in the, U are in the EU. These countries make things, they trade, they increase their wealth, they have diplomatic relations with other countries, and some of them are a lot poorer than Britain. Britain is the fifth largest economy in the world. It is a nuclear power, and people are actually in all, serious, in all seriousness thinking that somehow this country is in capable of functioning outside of a political, economic, one-day monetary, one-day very soon military union that's totally anti-democratic in nature. I mean, is Britain the upper volta with rockets? Or should I say the upper volta with the city of London? What nonsense! If small economies can survive independently, of course a big one can survive independently. Tom, thanks for the call. Lorne is in Ireland. Lorne. Hi, Doris. Big uh fan. Thank you, sir. Hey. When someone with a fan, I'm going to start my own show, the granny of all talk shows. Who's our granny? I'm not getting that. Can we call Tom back, uh, Lorne, back again? Because the, the line's not clear enough. Uh, Patrick McCarthy says, if you were a Republican and voting in your state primary, would you support Trump, Sanford, the Eagles guitarist, or Rockefeller Republican Weld. This is, of course, a reference to Joe Walsh, uh, a yeah. former Republican congressman, I do believe, who's farcically challenging Trump. Well, futility is all well and good when you're a teenager in love, but in politics, I think futility is best avoided, and if you're a wise political mind, you can see it coming from a mile away. Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee. Bet your house on it. Bet your wife on it. Bet everything on it. I'm, it it's just totally futile. He He's the incumbent president, and he's not in the kind of situation that, for example, Ford found himself in in 76, or even that which George H.W. Bush found himself in in 1992, and Buchanan, Pat Buchanan, uh, came within striking distance during yeah, the primary. But yeah, even then, the incumbent won. With someone like Donald Trump, all this is going to result in is some new nicknames that he's going to give these people on Twitter. Harry is in the West Midlands. Harry, welcome. George... Brilliant show, as always. Been following you for years. And, Thank you. Uh, you will recall that you followed our uh, channel, Youth Views, on Twitter. Oh, yes. Ago. Yes, yes, much. yes. Very good. Very good channel. Go ahead. Thank you. George, what I wanted to talk about today was um, about this. I know you guys were talking earlier about this, uh, these, this Brexit debate, the Brexit story. What I'm a little bit unsure about, I remember a tweet that you uh, put up some days ago, was that you felt that Jeremy Corbyn wanted a general election straight away as yeah. soon as uh, Mr Johnson was, uh, was wishing for it to happen. Yeah. But you also said that the people in the parliamentary party, the people around him, were actually forcing him or wished for him mm -hmm. to have that general election later rather than mm -hmm. sooner. Mm -hmm. um, and I, for the love of God, I've been following this for, for a little while, so uh, we're a little bit well-researched on this. Wasn't really too sure why would Jeremy Corbyn, given everything that you said earlier, and I, I certainly agree with a lot of what you said, but um, at the moment, Labour and the general elections would be Turkey's voting for Christmas. Why would Jeremy Corbyn want to general election straight away? Because, first of all, it would uh, minimise the time available for Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson to put together a full electoral pact. It would have plunged okay. us into a general election already, uh, and that's not the best circumstance, because you're asking candidates to stand down. And I'm here to tell you not many candidates want to stand down, even in forlorn and hopeless seats, uh, having invested their dreams in one day becoming the uh, Member of Parliament for Nether Wallop. Uh, they are uh, extremely loath to uh, demobilise. Secondly, uh, it avoids the Tory lead growing 
even larger. And that's what's happening now. Uh, Saturday's poll had the Tories 10 points ahead. Sunday's poll has them 14 points ahead. I'm willing Although to... Although, Comrades, I was just looking at a, a poll a few minutes ago. Comrades has uh, Labour uh, one or two points ahead. Uh, w one or two points ahead? Yeah. What's the date of that poll? Uh, I think between the 4th and 6th of uh, September. George. I haven't seen that one. I'll ask my friends to show it to me. I did make the point that of the last seven polls, uh, of course, the lead was much smaller than that. But Absolutely. the last two polls, of which I'm aware have the Tories stretching their lead, 10 and then 14. But I will look at that Comrade's point. But that's not the only reason why uh, Jeremy Corbyn favoured an early election. I think the main reason is he knows that it looks, frankly, absurd for the leader of an opposition who's been really? demanding a general election year yeah. after year on a daily basis now to yeah. be saying, I don't want a general election. Yeah, Last word to you, right, Harry. You're right. What about this, this concept, though, George, of uh, potentially pushing uh, Boris Johnson into breaking that promise of mm. uh, delivering Brexit mm. by mm. 31st of October? Yeah. Wouldn't, would, would you think there's some political collateral there? I honestly in terms don't. Of what they want to do? I honestly don't, Harry, because if he did, it would be abundantly clear that he did because Labour and the Liberal Democrats forced him to but mainly because I'm absolutely certain that he will not do it. Uh, he may die in a ditch, he may go to prison, he may go to Brussels and not ask for an extension, but I'm absolutely certain that he will not go to Brussels and ask for an extension. Adam, what do you think about that? Well, the Labour policy right now is so... It, it, it's chaotic to the point of, of being suicidal. I mean, the Rolling Stones did sing, you can't always get what you want, but Labour's election policy seems to be, we don't always want what we want. <laughs> I mean, for two years, uh, Corbyn, who admittedly next to the foul aroma of May, I mean that uh, metaphorically, if anything, she probably bathed too much. Uh, but Corbyn once looked like a breath of fresh air next to May. He doesn't anymore. He looks like a tired old scarecrow now and after two years of saying bring on an, an election bring on an election and now s sitting on their hands and then they shove Thornbury onto the television why they selected her of all people I have no idea a more condescending that was person. a major mistake wasn't it Harry P uh, Thornbury it's shambles I, I saw that on question time and I was cringing, guys. Yeah, that was yeah. a shambles. People were hiding People, behind the sofa. Uh, quite and, right. But let and, me and, deal and with one point that, uh, that Adam made and then I'll get your view on it. Uh, first of all, I think Jeremy Corbyn looks better than he used to look. I'm not saying that he took my sartorial advice. I'm not talking uh, uh, physically. But, my yeah, name. but Scarecrow, I mean, Bernie Sanders looks much more like a Scarecrow than Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn. And I'm supporting him. Uh, and he's doing pretty well. Um, you don't think this is an issue, do you? That Jeremy's very much older than Johnson? No, I don't think that in this day and age that matters. When I, when I speak in that term, I'm using it metaphorically. He looks like a punching bag. He looks like, to borrow a word that I learned from you, a popinjay, who's sort of a, a, a soldier of misfortune and who's been strung out by the rest of his poetry. But that's not an excuse for a leader. If you're going to lead, it's got to mean something. You've got to do more than just appeasing people who are the same ones who were knifing you in the back. The only thing different now is he's turned around and gracefully allowed them to knife him in the front. It's not well, a good that, look. I mean, that is true to this extent, Harry, that uh, Jeremy Corbyn clearly is not calling the shots, uh, and, and not just on Brexit, but principally on Brexit. Uh, he is being forced, partly by the defection of his formerly close friends and allies, John McDonnell and uh, Diane Abbott, into the camp of Starmer and Thornbury and Watson and co. Uh, the balance has shifted and Jeremy Corbyn uh, is simply not in charge. It's, it's looking like that, George, isn't it? And um, I, I actually do fear for the heartlands in terms of where those votes will go. And with the emergence of the Brexit party, we know many of these individuals won't vote for Tories no matter what. 
it gives them an alternative. Mm. But I just wonder, I just wonder, is, is that what Labour's strategy is? Do they want to split that sort of Tory vote? And is that why they're sort of leaning a little bit, well, more than a little bit, on the Remain position in order to sort of attack the Lib Dems? Well, uh, uh, up to a point, uh, I think uh, you're on to something there. I referred to it earlier. Uh, if there is a non-aggression pact, still more if there is an electoral pact, a coupon election, uh, between Johnson and Farage, uh, then Labour is done for. I think you're talking a landslide defeat for Labour. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If that yeah. deal isn't done, then, give it, then it's a four-party race. Then you've got the Liberal Democrats on 20-something, Labour on 20-something, the Tories on high 20s, uh, and the Brexit Party on low 20s. Uh, anything can happen in an election like that, and every seat will be... Uh, you'll have to wait, you'll have to bite your nails until the result is declared. Not many seats will be predicted. But I'm with Adam on this, Harry. It just seems to me inconceivable that Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage will not make a deal. It's an interesting one. It's an interesting one because actually, if uh, with, with this implosion of the Conservative Party, it does, uh, I think that's the only way Johnson can survive. I really do. Yeah, I think in the longer term, you'll see a merger uh, of the two parties. After all, once they've Brexited, uh, then the Brexit party, by definition, uh, its work is done. And so I see a fusion, and uh, uh, that fusion would command the support, do the maths, of 50% of the electorate. And 50% of the electorate is easily a winner. You only need... Yeah. Uh, uh, Labour got 40% and came within uh, a whisker of winning the last general they election. Did. If, you, if you've got they a combined did. force of 50, it's unbeatable. Harry, thanks you very are. much indeed for the call and stay in touch. Best of luck with your website. Very good indeed it is. This is the mother of all talk shows. Uh, sorry about that, a little uh, hiccup. Sherlocked asks, what are your predictions about the Julian Assange case? Do you think they will arrest Ed Snowden someday as well? Well, not if he stays in Russia, they won't. Mm -hmm. uh, but what are your predictions about the Julian Assange case? Oh, all too grim. In fact, uh, just under a week ago, I saw one of my musical heroes, Roger Waters, performing the song Wish You Were Here for Julian Assange. How very, did that go? It was very well attended. Uh, the great journalist, and I don't like most journalists, but he truly is great, John Pilger, oh, yes. long-time friend of Julian Assange. Oh, yes. he, he spoke, and so the event was very moving. Roger as passionate as one expects when one sees a Roger Waters' performance, but my prognosis for Assange is very grim. Frankly, the only thing that could potentially help him is if Trump wins a second term and decides to pardon him because he was citing WikiLeaks or truthful information. Mm. So whether you love Trump or hate Trump, you can't fault someone for citing the truth. Uh, he cited that truthful information and it would be, frankly, a, a bit poor form to allow the torture, imprisonment and possible execution of a man whose only crime was telling a truth and a truth that he a happened truth that to he enjoy. Himself deployed. Yeah. Quite Here's so. Mark in California on the line. He's a physicist, wants to talk science on 9-11. Mark, you're welcome. The floor is yours. Oh, hi, George. Hi, Adam. Thanks for taking the call. Welcome. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give you a, a short kind of pitch from a scientific perspective on some of the uh, troubles with the 9-11 the uh, official story. Um, the main observation, if, if anyone's listening who is a scientist or maybe a high school physics teacher or a student or something, uh, then they should consider the following point, which is the buildings, they all fell at free full speed. Now that means that all the potential energy of the building was converted to downward kinetic energy. That means there's no potential energy left over to do the other things that you need to explain. 
for example, it takes a huge amount of energy to pulverize the steel so that that steel can no longer uh, hold itself up. So where did the energy come from to do that? Uh, you've got 100,000 tons of steel that was projected laterally. That means sideways, up to 600 feet. Uh, they've seen steel girders penetrating uh, buildings two blocks away, clocked at 80 miles an hour. That requires a huge amount of energy. Where did the energy come from to do that? Uh, furthermore, you can look at it, instead of from uh, an energy conservation perspective, you can look at it from a momentum uh, perspective. Um, if the upper floors are crushing the lower floors, why didn't they stop as they were doing the crushing? You know, if a car plays into a lorry and it crushes the lorry, then the car slows down. So why didn't the upper floors slow down when they hit the lower floors? Uh, there are many, many other uh, anomalies like this, and by far the simplest way to explain all of it is to just say this is a demolition. But why would you need a belt and braces, Mark? Why would you need to fly two aeroplanes into the Twin Towers and dynamite them at the same time? Oh, well, presumably you, you, you fly the planes in for for, you know, to get your political uh, end met. It, it's not going to look as spectacular if you just demolish it. No, I, I, I mean, nothing could be more spectacular than these two landmark buildings falling down as a result of an explosion. Uh, the number of people that you now, on your thesis, now have to have involved is not just the people on the aeroplanes, not just the hijackers, because we know there were hijackers and we know there were people lost on the aeroplanes, but you'd have to have another unknown number of people planting dynamite in two of the most iconic towers in the world. Thus, the cast of dozens becomes a cast of hundreds, and yet not one of that cast has yet come forward and said, I was one of them that dynamited it. Isn't that a bit far-fetched? Yeah, I definitely take that point. Um, my problem is, looking at it from a scientific perspective, is that um, all of my kind of physical intuition is absolutely screaming at me that yeah. that can't happen the way that, they said it happened. That I understand. So all yeah. I can do is, is, is get my point out there and share it with people. Well, you have done. And, and, you know, and uh, encourage others to look at it. You have done, Mark, and I'm grateful to you for doing so. Uh, it all adds up, doesn't it, uh, Adam, to uh, the, the simplest uh, of conclusions that we don't know nearly as much as we need to know about such an epoch-making event. Quite right. We do know about the victims of the event. Uh, someone talked about Iraq and the other wars. I think that, of course, uh, that's a huge and horrific uh, a, a consequence of the tragedy. But the death of free speech in Western countries that supposedly were bastions of this, I think that that long, slow and agonizing death that we're in the middle of now really began in earnest on September the 11th. So whilst there's many visible victims, the 3,000 in the United States, the million in Iraq, that many more in Syria, Libya, Egypt, Afghanistan. Free speech is the intangible but very important victim of that horrific atrocity. Uh, Richard Peach says, Jeremy just wants power in or out of the EU. Ideally out, but his main goal is power. Same for Boris. And Alec Moss makes an important point. He raises... A point of order in relation to your last caller. Piers Corbyn is not a climate change denier. Rather, he proposes a cause other than CO2 for changes in climate, namely the large ball of plasma we call the sun. Let's take uh, John in Sweden. My goodness, they're all over the world tonight. John, welcome. Thanks very much, uh, George. I'm, I'm actually from Greenock. So, I can tell that. Uh, I can <laughs> tell that from your accent. Are you a Celtic uh, man, John? Uh, I'm neither Rangers nor Celtic. I don't Green, suffer Green, from Greenock uh, Martin. No, I, I, Greenock Martin, but I, I have to tell you, I don't suffer from old firm itis. Do you know what that is? No. Well, old firm itis is uh, if one law establishes that you've got, uh, you're a Morton fan. They 
automatically shoehorn you into the other camp. Yeah. And I've but experienced that with Rangers uh, and Celtic uh, fans. My, my old uh, friend Arthur Montfort uh, used to claim to be a Greenock Morton fan, but tears were running down his face through his makeup every Saturday night when he had to report when Rangers lost. But the rest of the world doesn't actually know what we're talking about. So get to your point, John. Well, my, my point, and forgive me if, I'm, if I've got a bit of stage fright here, because um, first of all, my name's John Nicholson. I'm a member of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Okay. I have 30 years structural engineering work, specifically on air, aerospace structures. Yeah. Now, your piece with Ian Henshaw, just um, collapsed my sails because um, you stated right at the start that you didn't believe the Americans did that to themselves. That's right. That is often a tangent. What I'm getting at is the structural physics of it. That's the engineering physics behind it. And a recent report, let me go to the computer now, has been issued by... Uh, the Department of Civil Engineering at University of Alaska Fairbanks, with lots of authors, it's out now. And what that does is it conclusively determines that the NIST report, that's NISD, National Institute for Standards and Technologies, is a fraud. And it shows that the World Trade Center number seven, which wasn't actually even in the commission's report, that's the official commission's report, was brought brought down essentially, not by fire, but he was brought down by other methods. The only other technology available to us is uh, explosives. So that's that one. But what do you, t but what do you say to the point I made to the previous caller? Uh, if you were going to hijack two aeroplanes with all that that entailed and so spectacularly smash them into two towers, why would you also need to dynamite the building. If you were doing it to create uh, 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 basically a casus belli for a war, the two aeroplanes is enough, or the explosives, or uh, the explosives is enough. George understood. But you conflate. I want this is what I want the main point of my call. I want you to nail down the engineering physics, which means I don't want you to get a journalist on the show. I want you to get a an engineer, architect, an engineer on this show to actually nail down the causes of it. Right, the, the, and from the, the physics, once established and emblazoned in people's minds, then uh, the question of who done it mm. will naturally flow from that. Okay, the John. Physics has to be nailed down first of all. Well, uh, you've then, done well. You're the second. You're the second scientist we've had on uh, in the last half hour. Uh, so uh, I'm grateful to you, both of you, uh, for that. But uh, it's not the only subject uh, that we're talking about tonight. And the hour is late. Carlos is on the line. I'm not sure from where. He wants to talk about Sanders. Go ahead, Carlos. Hi, John. How are you? I'm good, George. thank you. Uh, good, good. Uh, hey, I just wanted to say I'm a, I'm a great fan of yours. And like, I heard your, um, your speech in the Senate. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much. That was quite a while ago. Thank you very much. Great fan. That was a good day for so, me. My, <laughs> yes, I, I mean, we should have more people like that here in, in the Senate so mm. that they can confront the political powers that, that take a hold of our, uh, of our country. Yeah. Thank you. But, Go ahead, sir. But, but I have a question. I'm, I'm from California. I'm from mm -hmm. Los Angeles, California. Mm -hmm. And I have a question to Adam. Uh, Recently, uh, there has been like polls run about 30 of them, where 29 of them put Sanders above um, Trump. Uh, some of them come from Fox News, CNN, NBC. Uh, what makes him think that, or what would make, what would justify Trump winning? You know. Okay. Uh, the... Good question, and thank you very much for your kind words, Adam. Uh, why do you think that Trump is a shoe-in as the next president of the U.S.? 
because I think in the states where he needs to win in order to push him over the line, because in the American system, there is, especially in recent decades, there are certain states that one knows will always go Democratic and other states that one knows will always go Republican. This was always two to a degree, but this level of predictability has solidified many times over since the turn of the century, in some ways since the 90s. But then there's those post-industrial or semi-industrial Midwest states. There's Florida, which is always sort of the ace in the pack. And then there's a few others that you need to win in order to get into the White House. In those states, I think most people will see the current Democratic Party, irrespective of who they pick as the nominee, as just being too socially liberal for what is both literally and metaphorically middle America. When you combine that with the fact that the economy hasn't yet sh uh, shrunk and it hasn't yet collapsed, it will no matter who's in the White House because of the idiocy of the Federal Reserve, but none of that has happened yet. If Trump pulls out a trade deal with China, the markets will react in a positive way, which is why I think he's waiting to pull that out of the hat until as close to the election as possible. The people in places like Ohio and like Pennsylvania will say, look, we're going to keep the status quo and the Democrats have frankly been a bit too off the wall for our liking. In California, it's a different story. In California, the Democrats will probably win bigger than ever, but that doesn't matter because all you need is 51% to get that and the Democrats Democrats have traditionally in recent years got California anyway and states similar. Thanks, Carlos. Let's take a very quick break. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Tune in Tuesdays to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for Women in Society with Professor Hannah Dickinson, where we talk about the major issues, challenges, and struggles facing women in all aspects of society. Hannah Dickinson, professor and organizer with the Geneva Women's Assembly, joins the show this Tuesday and every Tuesday on Loud and Clear. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money-related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at SputnikNews.com. Okay, uh, let's rattle through as many as we can. Sorry if we don't get to you. I know there's a huge, huge queue of people to speak to us. DJ is in Oregon, but wants to talk about Brexit. DJ, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. And may I say it's a real honor to, to be able to speak to you. I Thank you, go to the university. I go to the University of Portland here in Oregon. And you are a major topic in our class of international politics. Oh, thank so you. It's an honor. You should invite thank me. You. If Donald Trump lets I, me in, I'll come and talk to you. <laughs> that, that would be wonderful, sir. Um, thank you. Uh, forget, forgive me for being a little nervous. Um, one okay. of the topics I wanted to uh, ask you, sir, is I read two articles recently in The Independent and The Metro, I believe, yeah. where it stated that if Boris Johnson's policy of Brexit did not go through because of the legislation passed in the Commons. Yeah. If you were to resign, it has been speculated by at least those two sources that I mentioned that Ken Clark and possibly Harriet Harman, the father and the mother of the house, I believe if I've used the terms correctly, yeah. would be would be willing to be considered as a caretaker prime minister to sort of negotiate a deal of Brexit. No, I, I, I'm trying to understand if Brexit, if Brexit doesn't happen the way Boris Johnson wants and he gets fed up and resigns, is it possible for a caretaker prime minister to step in and totally circumvent the leader of the opposition, if I'm understanding the, 
policy of it's only, appointing uh, a government? Yeah. No, you've understood it uh, extremely well. Credit to Portland University. Uh, but it can only happen because Jeremy Corbyn has a very large number of traitors in his own ranks. If the Labour Party mm. stood firm and said there's only going to be one caretaker prime minister here, and that is the leader of the opposition. I believe that would be a poison chalice, but if anyone has a right to it, it's him. But the problem for Corbyn is that a very large number, well over 100 of his own MPs, uh, that is to say, well, uh, certainly half, I'd go half of his MPs, don't want him to be the Prime Minister, even as a caretaker, because it might just actually last longer than you think. They don't want to see the optics of their own leader coming in and out of Number 10 Downing Street. So they, together with the other opposition parties, would much rather have someone that they would dub a centrist, and Mr Clark is the uh, in front, front runner because he was a Conservative. He was in the Ted Heath government in 1970-74. Then he was in the Margaret Thatcher government from 79 onwards. He was in John Major's government. He was in David Cameron's uh, government. Uh, and I'm not sure if he was even uh, briefly in Theresa May's government. I think he actually was. So he's got the longest track record. And he's just been kicked out of the Conservative Party. So I did read about that. He's your, uh, he's your uh, identikit centrist. He's not in a party. He's very old. He's as old as the hills. And uh, he's got a very long uh, track record. So if they are going to successfully install uh, a caretaker prime minister, it will be him. Uh, but uh, uh, Corbyn's uh, shadow chancellor, John McDonnell said today that only Jeremy Corbyn can fill those uh, can fill that position. The problem is, too many Labour MPs are ready to agree to someone else. Let me go to Patrick in Louisiana. Thanks, DJ, for your call. Patrick, you're the last call of the evening. Be quick, please. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Galloway, I, it's an honor to speak to you. I just wanted to ask about your opinion regarding a monetary policy mm -hmm. in the United States, yeah. namely the Federal Reserve System. And if you believe that the United States and other governments throughout the world should adopt um, essentially the monetary policy that we had at the beginning of the formation of the American Republic, i.e. a national bank, which would be used to distribute and issue, issue currency and funds to the different states and provinces for infrastructure programs and, and, and policies, you know, roads, bridges, schools, hospitals, or do you think the elimination of any sort of bank, whether it be a national bank or a bank that's pretty much under control, the control of private interests, i.e. the Fed, would be a better approach? Very uh, erudite question, and so the cleverest man in England will have to answer it. Adam. Well, I think one of the best things that Andrew Jackson ever did when he was president was abolish the second bank of the United States, which itself had fewer powers than the Federal Reserve, but still managed to cock things up. One of the things with money is you cannot abolish money at a conceptual level. Society uh, and the market, which in this case will reduce itself to the same thing, will always find money, no matter how many central banks try to manipulate it, no how no matter how many cartels like the Federal Reserve try to distort it. And so the best thing for the United States, and these issues generally revolve around the U.S. because it, uh, it prints the reserve currency, happens to print it out of thin air. I think that the U.S. was at its most successful under the classical gold standard from the 1870s up to 1913 when the Fed was created. So my own view is that a pivot back to the gold standard, which Dr. Ron Paul in his early 80s book, The Case for Gold, said would take about 10 years, is the best way to go. I don't think how however, that this is going to happen until the mother of all depressions, which will happen, I believe, before 2050. But unfortunately, uh, people aren't taking the necessary precautions to avoid that by pivoting to gold while we still can do it easily.
Thank you, uh, Patrick, for that call. Don't be a stranger. Call back again earlier in the evening so we can give you a longer answer. Uh, I want to tell you about some uh, mother of all talk shows, road shows, that are coming up. Most of them involve me and Adam. Well, all of them involve me. And indeed, all of them involve uh, Adam. Some of them involve our legendary friend, Brian Travers, the founder and saxophonist of UB40. And the first of those is on Friday next in West Brom. It's at West Brom Community Centre, Gayton Road, G-A-Y-T-O-N, Gayton Road in West Brom. And there'll be me, Adam, and Brian Travers. There's only about 150 seats. It's free. Fill it. And then we've got Saturday the 19th of October in Liverpool at 7.30 p.m. It's the Liner Hotel. Uh, and the tickets are on sale at Ticket Quarter. And the uh, uh, support artists as such are Brian Travers, Adam Gary, and an incredible young band called the Jade Assembly. Look them up. They are absolutely fantastic. They've even done a song for Brexit. And the second date is Friday the 22nd of November in Leicester at the Sioux Townsend Theatre. And again, tickets on sale at Ticket Quarter. And the third date is in my home country of Scotland in East Kilbride. It's Saturday the 18th of January in East Kilbride Village Theatre. And you can get the tickets from the theatre. Uh, the previous caller, Patrick, asked, can we bring our road show to the States? <laughs> I'd love to do that. It would be wonderful. We could get a big Winnebago and cross the United States uh, on these uh, highways. Uh, you'd get in. I'm not sure if I'd get in. That's the only... Uh, <laughs> That's the only. If it uh, were drawback. up to me, Ron Paul would be your saxoph. Well, not a saxophonist, but, but I know a, what you mean. A monetary I know, expert. I know what you mean. How long have I got? I've got to be out of here at 59:15. So I've got four minutes to ask you a couple of questions, if I may. Of course. Uh, Patrick McCarthy asks: Being in favour of capital punishment must be a minority position in the UK, right? I'm personally in favour of it in some cases. But I believe such issues should be determined on the state, provincial and local level. Do you agree? Ask Adam. Quick answer. Well, state would be US, provincial would be Canada. Uh, but it, it does seem that it's a minority position uh, in the UK, although I'm not so sure that it's as much of a minority position as the liberal elite would have one believe. With crime going up, and violent crime in particular, going up so rapidly, London's now more dangerous than New York. I think just as I was laughed at 10 years ago for moaning about the EU, I think perhaps capital punishment might become a majoritarian view uh, uh, in 10 years, hopefully not because of a bigger crime wave, but I don't see things improving. Well, I'm against it because Indeed of the are. danger of uh, error, uh, an error that can never be rectified. And I know personally know people that would, would have been hanged, uh, Irish people who would have been hanged uh, on trumped-up charges uh, if uh, hanging had existed, but also for moral philosophical reasons. I think the state becoming an executioner would diminish us all. Cat, uh, whatever, says, I'm disappointed in George's take on 9-11. I usually agree on everything else. Rogue Cow says, it doesn't take a genius to see those towers rigged to fall straight down demolition style. I think we're going to have to return to this subject. Absolutely, we it's a big one. It. We haven't done it justice really tonight because of the big Brexit story. Dan Burns says, even the flight instructor of the, instructor of the hijackers who hit the Twin Towers said that they weren't capable of flying a single engine plane, never mind a commercial airliner. And P. McCabe says, if the Remainers are correct in the nightmare scenario of no deal, I have to ask why have successive parliaments and governments let us get into such a position where we are so reliant on the EU. It is a disgrace. P. McCabe, that is the tweet of the night. Absolutely. Because that is precisely the point. If we cannot survive by being outside of the European Union, 
Why? Who's responsible for that? If we don't grow enough food to keep ourselves fed, and if we can't import from the rest of the world efficiently enough to feed ourselves, ditto. Medicines, we invented penicillin. It was invented in Scotland, in my old constituency. So you're telling me that we need Slovakia and Romania and Slovenia in order to be able to get medicines? I see a story today that we're going to run out of fuel. Why? Are we buying our fuel from the European Union? Of course we are not. So, but insofar as we can't handle it, then we have to blame those who governed us all these years in the European Union. So Adam and I will be back next week at the same time, same place. It's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you, but you can catch us for free, live, in person, next Friday at the West Brom Community Centre in Gayton Road. All of the West Midlands, all of the black country should be there. I've been George Galloway. This has been the mother of all talk shows. Come back next week, bring another listener. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Radio Sputnik, we speak your language. Find us at sputniknews.com.